You know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texags Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texags Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as clear a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had <laughs> no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, that 50-50 ball, I gotta come down with. You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. Winning is fun, doesn't matter how it gets done. Especially when you're 17 and 0. Welcome into Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, Go Hour, presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations, presenting today's Oscar. Olin Buchanan dressing all nice and spiffy as he's getting ready to head out to Nashville for the SEC basketball tournament. Good morning, OB. Good morning. What's up? Um, like you said, I'm preparing to uh, make that trip uh, actually to Austin first. Okay. And fly to Nashville. Tough job. Somebody's I like Nashville, it. man. I'm jealous. That's a good trip. I uh, I enjoyed most of my uh, six years living up there. Yeah. The laying off, the getting laid off part, I wasn't crazy. No, about. that part sucks. <laughs> Actually, it was a blessing. Without that's, that, you're not here. That's true. And that is where I was living when I was always appearing on uh, as a weekly guest on the David Nuno college football talk show. That was called, hold on, Rivals on Yahoo Sports Radio with yeah. David Nuno and special guest, Olin Buchanan. Y'all called me coach. Yeah, well, that was uh, the producer, Will Moriarty, because <clears throat> he would play the coach uh, right. theme music right. from the TV show, Coach. Uh, OB, look, man, a and baseball has had a couple of, three games in a row that have been dicey at moments, right? Okay, yeah. Two games in a row where they've had nice leads, and those have evaporated. And, you know, one went into extra innings. One was close to going to extra innings. I don't care how they win. I mean, with class, of course. I think you understand yeah, what I mean. My right. point is, I don't care if it's to walk to win it, if it's a base hit to win it, a grand slam. Like, they all feel good. At the end of the day, every win matters. Mm -hmm. It's about to start really mattering in a different way with conference play oh, yeah. starting, right? But, like, you know, this team, I think yesterday the stat was before entering the game, 12 of 16 games A&M had scored in the first inning. That number should be now 13 of 17 games, yeah. and they did it uh, with a with a bomb from uh, Jay Slavalette there in the first inning. Yeah, two home runs yesterday. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that... Um, the way they've had to hold on, come from behind, you know, to win, these last, especially these last two games, <clears throat> I, I can see where you might be concerned, but it's certainly no reason to panic. Yep. Um, what it, d does it raise questions um, about Sunday starts and midweek starts, you know, yeah, it does, but but I mean, it doesn't it doesn't mean oh my gosh, uh, it's a lost cause or anything like that. It's it's like okay, uh, it you know what's it going to be like? How how are these guys going to improve? Can I'm, they improve that kind of thing? But I'm going to do the buzz thing here, okay? The buzz yeah. thing is like, and we've used this, and and this year you could say maybe it didn't work out the way you expected it to, but um, with buzz teams. Mm -hmm. We feel that they will get better as the season goes on. There's right. development. And mm -hmm. even this year, there was a huge dip in that, but it seems like they're now heading in, back in that direction. You could say the same thing for a Schlossnagel team here at A&M. Mm -hmm. Year one, non-conference play wasn't great, and they were great in SEC play. Last year, they had pitching issues all year long, mm -hmm. but I feel like, I mean, they were, they were so close to going to the Super Regional, right? Like, And, and possibly hosting the Super Regional. So this is a... This is not a finished product. 
Right. Max Wiener is getting his 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 final touches on this pitching staff as the year goes on. Schloss and company, Nolan Kane, the whole crew, uh, Michael Early, they're all getting it set for this big season about to start, the, the big conference part of it. 100% agree. Um, so that's why I say it's no reason to panic. Nope. Guys are going to get better. They're going to develop you. At least you think so, right? You think so. But if you if you just said, oh, anytime there's a um, – a problem area or something looks problematic, if you just always dismissed it, um, then I think that, you know, you're kidding yourself because sometimes, not necessarily in this situation, but sometimes you see reasons to be concerned and yeah. they blow up to be, to be problems. Well, the travel roster is going to get shrunk when they go on the road. So yesterday, Schloss called it basically an audition for these mm-hmm. pitchers because he wants to know who he can trust and take on the road. Yeah, and you know, they had guys that would come in. I was uh, keeping up with it as best I could and um, would pitch well in spurts. Yep. And maybe maybe the other, you know, maybe the Bearcat started figuring them out a little bit, so you had to go to somebody else. But, I mean, there were, despite all the uh, the hits given up and the runs given up, I mean, there were, I think there were there were signs from, Several of the pitchers that, hey, Max Wiener has something to work with here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I don't want to be all Pollyanna about it and say, oh, yeah, everything's fine. Don't worry. You know, when, when th- th- there could be some work to be done to shore up your midweek pitching and your Sunday pitching. If perfection is what you're looking for, yes. Well, then you right? th- then you wait, wait right. till Friday. But, uh, <laughs> well, so far, yes. But, uh, there's going to be no complaining about 17 and 0. And are there things that they want to clean up? Yes. By the way, there's probably games. Um, what's the what's their biggest blowout this year? Whatever their biggest blowout is this year, I'm sure there's a couple things Schloss would have liked to clean up in that game because that's the job of a coach is to fix things and refine things, especially when you have legitimate college World Series aspirations, mm-hmm. yeah. right? So. Uh, if there are any reasons to be, and maybe concerns too, too dramatic, uh, curious about mm-hmm. some of the pitching, um, you know, you feel confident you got the guys in charge that can uh, address the situations if it needs to be addressed. If you look at three games or two games of interesting pitching for, through a few innings, then sure. If you look at 17 games, pitching's been phenomenal. One of the best in the country, if not the best. Uh, let's hear from Schloss yesterday because Sam Houston uh, had a couple of pitchers out there that were dealing. They, they did a very nice job. Here's Schloss kind of breaking it down uh, post-game yesterday. We competed well against a good pitcher. He, he's a really good pitcher. You touched on it, but you know you can't plan it that way. He tested two games in a row to go into conference play yeah. and winning. I mean, you don't plan it that way, but that has yeah. to be a good, good yeah, way. Yeah, it's good for it. you. It's good for our team. Um, you know, we're trying to. I know it sounds coachy. We're trying to make every day opening day. And I heard somebody on the radio say this morning that the Sam Houston that this game meant more to Sam Houston than it did to Texas A&M. And I told our team that, and they all called that the BS that it is. It, 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 Every single game means something to us, and and whether it's Sam Houston or Florida, and so I'm gonna tell that guy to find another job. Well, I'm not gonna find another job. Unless, I thought it was um, me. I was like, did I say that on unless, the air yesterday? Unless Billy, you know, fires me. Well, but, that's coming. But um, yeah, I'm the one that said that, and I do believe that. The same reason I believe that um, that when a SEC team plays in a bowl game, that it means more to the opponent because there's valid, there's more validation. It doesn't mean that. Uh, Texas A&M doesn't care about the game, that they don't want to win, that they're not taking it seriously. It just means I believe that when you have a when you're in that underdog role like a South, like a Sam Houston is in, um, and you have a chance to beat a a power. Yeah, well, I think it means more to you. Well, when I heard that bite last night, I was like, <laughs> did I say that? I don't remember saying that. I don't think I said that. I was like, it had to be Louie. I didn't think it was no, you. it was me. I didn't think it was you. I didn't remember that. Uh, I understand your point. I also understand Schloss. Like, no, no, this game matters to us, too. This team's right down the road from us. They're very good. We've got to win this game. Every game is important, especially as you're trying to host a regional, a super regional, get to the College World Series. They all matter. They all carry a, a similar weight. I also understand your point of, like, you know, if we can beat— when you're one of the top five teams in the country, mm-hmm. every team that you play— 
It's got you circled on their calendar. That, We've got to be. Absolutely. Beat them. Yeah. And, uh, well, and, and the mark of a great team, and I think A&M is going to be a great team, is that you treat those games the same way you treat Texas, the same way. Now, obviously, that is not possible over a long season. There, There's ebbs and flows, intensity changes. But great teams find ways to, to, win. Not, to not only win, sometimes step on the freaking throat as early as possible. Well, they didn't do that yesterday. No. I thought but they have done that. Were they up like 6-0? They were up 6-0. Yeah, so I remember thinking, okay, this one's in the bank. Yeah. And, uh, and it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Now, I don't know what – I have to admit, because I don't follow college baseball the way I used to back in the day, but I remember there was a time when Sam Houston was a very, very respectable college baseball program. I mean, yeah. respectable is not even, not even giving that, them uh, uh, enough credit for that, what they were. Now, I don't know what they are now. Well, let's uh, let's listen. Just kind of flip it for a second, because before we check it around the room, I want to talk a little basketball. You went to the presser yesterday with with Buzz Williams. Uh, I know one of the topics I believe that you brought up NCAA or NIT. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, and um, Anderson Garcia was he just wants to keep he playing. He just wants to play. He wants to keep playing. Um, Buzz was saying it was about the players, whatever the players that, that, want to yeah, do. Yeah, that was that. Right, uh, but overall. Uh, he wants them to be their best this week because if they're at their best this week, then they're going to play longer this year. Here, here's Buzz yesterday. 17 weeks going into conference play, and then we just played 10 weeks of conference. and So that's 27 consecutive weeks of work, and now this is week 28. And um, are we in? I don't know. I, I don't know who's on the committee. Uh, I do not participate in politics uh, nationally, I've never been on a committee of any sort. Uh, I, honestly, I'm not even good at politics at Texas A&M. Um, it's just not my gift. I don't think it's my calling. So we're in week 28, and we would like to play as many games this week as we can. And if we're good, then we'll play more games this week than any of the previous uh, 17 weeks of the season. And um, I guess it would be 18 weeks. So where will that be the next time that I talk to you guys? And what will the tenor of my conversation be? And I don't know. And um, I want to leave my ego out of it and try to do the best I can to help our guys and uh, hope that they are their best uh, when we need to be at our best. They need to be there at their best. I would like for a long run in the SEC tournament. I want to see more basketball, and I don't want to see NIT basketball. Well, I asked Buzz what he felt like they had to do in Nashville to be uh, to to feel secure about getting in the NCAA mm-hmm. tournament, and he said we got to win it. And that's probably that may be true. Yeah, which is why uh, I thought it was a appropriate time then. If you feel like you have to win it, well, if you don't, as a you know have to win as a seventh seed, and if you don't, would you would you you know would you be interested in playing in the NIT? Would you want right. to play in the NIT? Look, I'll watch the NIT, and I'll root for them to win the whole da- Will damn thing. Will you watch it if A&M's not playing? No. God, no. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah. But, uh, but honestly, the NCAA tournament, I'll watch it if A&M's not in it, but I won't care. Like, th- there won't – because on years that I know A&M shouldn't be in it, mm-hmm. it's easy to watch the other teams. On years that this could be us playing right now, that, that should be us. I don't know why I got so loud. Then I just like, oh, whatever, dude. I just Yeah, I'll just read about it on Twitter. Oh, I'll watch it, especially the first uh, two days. Yeah, but I get angry. Yeah, I'll, I'll watch, but I get angry. And I, and I think about Vanderbilt. And we, go. Oh, what happened to Vanderbilt? Well, I do get, I, I get angry. I'll probably get angry, like, if, if A&M, let's say they win a game or two in yeah. Nashville. Because if they, if they lose uh, Thursday, they, you know, no one has any reason to be angry. But if, yeah. they, if they win a couple games and say a team like Michigan State, or even Indiana State, right? Get in. That's what makes me angry because then I say, well, what are all these tough schedules supposed to do for yeah. you, and playing in a tougher league supposed to do for you, and winning quad one games and quad one two quad two games supposed to do for you? Then I'll be angry at that. But I have to admit, I still get into the tournament. Yeah, I get into it. But this is a year that I thought I had 
big visions. So, so get in so I can have those visions. Yeah, we all did. Yep. We all still do. Uh, let's get around the room. Go around the room and say hello to the people out there. If you want to be part of the conversation, you can do it. 979-693-1150. How do you feel about AM baseball? 17-0. and 0. And also uh, AM basketball. Big one coming up, uh, obviously, against Ole Miss and the women's team trying to get into the NCAA tournament. We had Joni Taylor on the show yesterday. We go behind the glass and we say hi to Nick Savage, who is doing the directing this morning. Nick, good morning, buddy. Howdy. Good morning, y'all. What's up? I feel pretty good about AM baseball being 17-0. How could you not, right? And, uh, you know, they're going into... Florida, Gainesville this weekend. Uh, they're kind of, they're rocky in their last five, two and five. They lost last night to Florida State, who is also the only other undefeated Division One college baseball program. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, there's a good chance. I don't expect them to sweep Florida by any means, but road wins in the SEC are at a premium, and I think they got a good chance to, to take the series this weekend. Hope so. Uh, I, I look at, Teams like Florida, there's a reason there are seven teams, including Florida, in the top 15. In the top 15, just about half are from the SEC. I think it's a, I think a reasonable goal in the SEC, in SEC baseball. To finish in the top seven? It's to finish 500. Yeah. And then anything over that is almost gravy. I'm not saying that a team like A&M should be content with going you know, 15 and 15. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if you finish – 500 in the SEC. Yeah. You're more than likely almost automatically in the uh in the playoffs. Yep, yep. In the, so any win over that 15 is is uh is steps toward ho- hosting. Yeah. And look at this stretch from March 28th till after the Bama series you got number and these are updated rankings. They're going to change by the time they play them, but number 18 Auburn here at number 20, South Carolina. Number nine, Vanderbilt at home. Go to Tuscaloosa to face number uh, 14, Alabama. Uh, and then, I guess, two weeks later, number two, LSU. And a couple weeks later, number one, Ole Miss. So, yeah. I, Arkansas, I, I, Arkansas. I'm with you, OB. Or, sorry. Yeah, Arkansas. Ole Miss is after LSU. But, uh, Ole Miss did um, win a national championship. Yeah. Or, you know, college yeah. World yeah. Series not yeah. long ago. <laughs> so, really, if you can go 500, you're moving on to the postseason, right? right? Every win over that is just a um, evidence that you should be – evidence not the right word. What am I trying to say? A Every data win point. over that is a data point to strengthen your argument toward being hosting. Only te- eight teams can host, but, you know, four of them are probably going to be SEC teams, if not more. Did you know that Aggies gather at the Angry Elephant? I know they do. Yeah. In, in Did, Little Elm and College yeah. Station and San Antonio and – in Magnolia. Magnolia. Yeah. Let's go to the uh, Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Callie Gardner's there. Callie, good morning. Good morning. How's it going? Uh, I think it's good. going well. It's good. It's you, know, going you know what the best – I apologize to the audience for saying this out loud, but the best part about today – What is that? Is I'm going to take a couple days off at the end of the week. <laughs> I'm going to watch basketball. I'm not completely – I mean, that's not a job, but I'm going to write notes and get ready for shows for next week, but I'm taking Thursday, Friday off. Ronnie's going to be here, so we'll ha- have a bump in listenership. That is awesome. That's not. You that's where you're. That. Spo- that's where you're supposed to say no, David. No, we'll miss you. No, miss like you oh so no, that's much. great. So what are we saying? The best part of the week is that Bronny's hosting. <laughs> <laughs> I've never, I've never been around for Bronny to host, so this should be, should be interesting. It'll be good. It'll be good. Hot It'll sports be. take, Jake. Yeah, I've got. I, I, I saw Bronny last night at the baseball game. I didn't get to say hello to him, but I saw him. We were. Um, sharing what I think was a same, similar opinion of some Sam Houston State hey, fans. So not but. Bronny specifically there, Callie, but I, I want to ask the group here, and Nick can j- jump in. Do you all ever see somebody that you know you should stop and say hi to, but you do everything in your power not to? Not because you don't like them, but you're just not in a chit-chat kind of mood. Yeah, all that was time. Nick the other day. All the to time. To me. Yeah, that, Nick did I, it yeah, to yeah, you, I yeah. forgot. I ran yeah. into Callie at the voting He didn't center. run into me. He, well, he saw me. I saw her from afar. I was like, is that, is that Kelly? See, and then I never went and approached her. So I don't think OB does that. I think if OB sees you, he's going to stop and talk People to you. People come to well, OB to talk to him. Yeah. I don't mind saying hi. But, they're, they're, but you know what I really wonder about, though? What's that? I wonder about what was uh, her and uh, Ronnie's uh, uh, opinion of some Sam Houston fans that they were sharing. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I would never have put it to Sam Houston that their fans would be obnoxious but there were a few last night that 
I thought were, was you, not uh, fond of. I'll say this. Even our, our beloved Aggie fans, there are some. There's one guy in particular I hope I meet. The guy who says I have a speech impediment. Um, there's one. You know, every fan base. I think A&M has a better fan base. Like I think for the most part, we're classy. For the most part, right? But we got idiots. They all got idiots. Yeah, every you know, baseball fans can be obnoxious. Oh, for and sure. And it doesn't matter what um, you know what team you're supporting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, few can be as obnoxious as the Wild Bunch over at Texas, <laughs> and and that's I was thinking that when I was working over there. You know, th- but th- if you're like say if you're a team that's playing A and M, and everybody's the and the Raggies are in full. Force that they annoy you. They're probably thinking, man, those guys are obnoxious. Yeah. Well, I mean, you look at the the USC pitcher's father who posted that. Did you see that on YouTube? I did not. Oh, he he posted a video of the ball the ball five chant on yeah. YouTube after we played USC and said maybe it was Arizona State. I think it was USC. Um, and he said, yeah, you know, college fan base terrorizes Terrorize. teenage uh, uh, scared pitcher or something mm-hmm. something along those lines. And, and this was the. The this pitcher's dad? The pitcher's dad. Oh, but and then he turned the comments off. And did he jump on the court and try to? Oh wait, that's a different story. I'm just thinking though, man, if if you're terrorized, well, if you can't by survive people, college right. baseball, I mean, that's like yeah, if you're that mentally weak, yeah, that's the sport. Yeah, and that's been it, a thing. But it, I mean, then everybody's gonna rag on you. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, but these these in particular were not fans that were, you know, the normal. I don't know. They were they were obnoxious, and I don't think they had much knowledge of the sport. So that's kind of where okay. my um, – but, you know. Callie, we're way late for a break, so we'll get more Let's updates here sh- shortly. Yeah. Sounds um, good. And uh, 210 says, hey, can I get a horse laugh from OB? Because he misses your horse laugh. He, he really likes it. There you go. That's for you, 210. <laughs> I got your back, buddy. All right, uh, Heritage Films time. Let's talk about it. Chance McLean's company. They make documentary films about uh, families, uh, your dad, your uncle, your family business, your family ranch. They really like just getting to know the family and telling that story. Uh, Chance has become friends with everybody. Like, literally, he's not one that will avoid eye contact when he sees you out in public. He'll come talk to you, and he'll tell her sh- your story. And then a couple weeks later, you get yourself a two-hour documentary that he does all the time. He loves it. It is his passion. He started doing it years back when Michael Berry, a talk show host in Houston, asked him to do one on his father, who was uh, in poor health. They got to tell that story, and now that family has that story forever and ever. And that's something you can do with your family, right? You get the, the family story done. And then the generation after generation gets to uh, share that amazing story. He also does a year flicks, a great one for like uh, Callie's family, right? Callie is about to um, graduate here from A&M soon. Let's do a year flicks, get a 20-minute video, find out where things are in life right now. Like, what are you thinking about doing with your career? What's the next step? Uh, how was it getting your Aggie ring? And then a couple years from now, you know, her her great job and she's a top broadcaster in the country and we're talking about that that is what a year flex does is a benchmark video that tells people's story in short condensed form with q a video form it's fantastic the uh, phone number for heritage films is 713-893-8341 713-893-8341 or check out yourheritagefilm.com yourheritagefilm.com
Nick Saban, people aren't like it's funny. Like social media is not a place. It's just a it's just a it's the mean streets of social media, right? Yeah. Uh, or Twitter can be. Uh, Saban, I thought had some really good talking points yesterday. Did you listen to any? I heard about it. Okay. And some people are like, "Oh, Nick Saban getting paid thirty million dollars from ESPN, asking you know, telling kids not to get paid." Uh, and that's not what I think he said. By the way, we're Texas Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. I want you to listen because I know you're about to leave because um, we're going to talk to Trey Wallace. I of forgot Outkick. I was about to leave. Yeah, well, you can stay. No, I Come can't. Come on, man, just stay. Miss my flight. But let's listen to uh, Nick Saban yesterday, and then I want to get some quick thoughts okay. from you before we hit a break. Here's uh, Nick Saban yesterday on Capitol Hill with Ted Cruz. Uh, you just retired from an amazingly and historically significant coaching career. How much did the current chaos and state of the law contribute to your decision to retire now? Well, all the things that I believed in for all these years, 50 years of coaching, no longer exist in college athletics. So it's always was about developing players. It was always about uh, helping people be more successful in life. Uh, my wife even said to me, we'd have all the recruits over on Sunday uh, with their parents for breakfast, and uh, she would always meet with the mothers and uh, talk about how she was going to help and uh, impact their um, sons and how they would be well taken care of. And she came to me, you know, like right before I retired and said, why, why are we doing this? And I said, what do you mean? She said, all they care about is how much you're going to pay them. They don't care about how you're going to develop them, which is all what we've always done. So why are we doing this? So, you know, to me, that was sort of a red alert that we really are creating a circumstance here that is not beneficial to the development of young people, which is why I always did what I did. Um, my dad did it. I did it. Um, so... And that's the reason that I always like college athletics more than the NFL is because you had the opportunity to develop young people. So, and I, I want their quality of life to be good. I think, as I said before, name, image, and likeness is a great opportunity for them to create a brand for themselves. Um, I'm not against that at all. Um, but to come up with some kind of a system uh, that still can help the development of young people, I think, is paramount to the future of college athletics. One of the other things he talked about, OB, was like, and he, I don't think he named it as collectives, but he basically was saying, we're paying players, but there's no advertisement. There's no name, image, and likeness in reality in some of these structures out there. And he brought up Bryce Young, who had deals, national deals with certain companies. I forget the companies that they were. He goes, that's what it should be about. Not about just a, a salary cap based on what a, um, a university can collectively get together. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Didn't he once uh, ask all of his uh, or a lot of his donors to give more money so they could pay him more? 100%. Now, you could say he did that because he was trying to keep up with the direction college football is going, even though he didn't like it. He didn't want to get lost. Um, and, I, and I get that. Uh, and I think he's got a lot of good points. I just don't know. Well, NIL was, is a right idea, and, it, and, it, and they should have it. It, it's it's not right that a player can't make money off his own name, image, and likeness when the universities absolutely did. Yep. But once again, who are you blaming? The NCAA fumbled the ball. They, they tried to block it and never put any any uh, guidelines or rules in place. So, hey, we're going to ask Congress to take care of us. And so I, I – Yes, there should be rules in place that keep players from uh, getting money illegally, yep. but not name, image, and likeness. If if uh, you know if a mattress store wants somebody to do his uh, uh, you know to read a commercial for him because he's a football player. Great. By all means. Yep. But if, you know, the idea is that AM was not supposed to broker the deal with that mattress company. But now that's what's happening all over the place. That is what's happening. OB, have a safe trip, buddy. Bet. We'll uh, talk to you tomorrow on Zoom. All right, let's hit a break. When we come back on Texags Radio, Trey Wallace of Outkick the Coverage was following the uh, the hearings there or whatever. Was it hearing? Is that what you'd call it? Hearing? I, I heard him. No. Yeah, we heard it. <laughs> 
the, the conversation there at Capitol Hill with uh, with uh, Nick Saban and others. So we'll uh, get into that with him, some other college football stuff, and NCAA tournament as well. That and more here on Tech Sags Radio. All right, we're back here on Tech Sags Radio. I got confused for a second because I saw a Zoom screen pop up, and that's where we find my guy, Trey Wallace from OutKick. Good morning, buddy. What's up, my brother? I like the, uh, like the bumper music. Thank you, man. How you been? I am uh, I'm good, man. Just trying to uh, navigate a little bit of NIL, a little bit of college football news, and then get on the road to Nashville and cover an SEC basketball tournament. Well, let's talk about yesterday, uh, those hearings. We just played one of the sound bites where Nick Saban went into depth of, you know, the direction this is going and why is he still doing this? Um, just right. your, your big takeaway from him in particular and, and what you heard. More so that this is becoming theater now, I think, in, in, in front of Congress. I, I think that we are getting to a point now, David, where um, – Congressmen and women will will bring just about anybody up uh, to speak about the subject, thinking that, and, and this is my opinion, thinking that something's going to get done in the next two months before everything is going to be focused on the election. Um, and, and that's why I have a hard time with this going in front of Congress anytime we can and, and speaking about this because, you know, and I, I look, I've spoken to a lot of administrators. I've spoken to a lot of congressmen and women. Uh, they got a lot more stuff going on right now. Uh, compared to whether or not college athletes should be paid and how they should be paid. But 
getting to the Nick Saban comments. Uh, this is uh, this is nothing that he hasn't said in the last two months in in exit interviews. Um, I, I think that the one thing that probably stood out was was Miss Terry's comments. You know, why are we doing this? Um, college college athletics has changed in general. And we are getting to a point now where we have to figure out a way who's going to be the one that governs this. Is this going to be the SEC? It's going to be the SEC and the Big Ten combined. Uh, Tony Petiti, Greg Sankey. Um, it, is is the NCAA going to stick around and be like, okay, we'll, we'll be some kind of governing arm when it comes to how we're going to pay players or, okay, whatever you guys need, let us know because we're still around type of deal. I think overall... I think we have gotten to a point now, this spring portal period is going to be pretty mad. Um, When you look at the new NIL regulations that are technically in place now because of the injunction filed by a judge in East Tennessee, I I think that you're going to see a lot more deals kind of being played out in the public when it comes to NIL. I don't, I don't have a problem with what Nick Saban is, is discussing because this has been a problem now for four years since NIL has been introduced. There was never any guardrails put around this. So it was always going to be pay for play. You know, I, I know you're going to have your star players. You, you remember that first kind of year or the second year it was like Jordan Addison went to USC and he, he signed up with United airlines and whatnot. Those type of deals are going to take place in the NIL spectrum. I think what they're getting at now and how this would play out, David, is you go to athletic departments taking care of all payments, revenue sharing pertaining to college athletics in in these players. And whether that means a a third string offensive lineman is going to get $45,000 a year, and that's how they're going to do it across the board, and then you can go make your money outside when it comes to NIL and sponsorships and how that part plays out. Okay. If that's how they want to do it, that's how they want to do it. But I think when it comes to, you know, you're going to have lawsuits involved in this. You're going to have to figure out who's going to govern this part of this. And when Nick Saban, look, he's still a face of college football, but when he comes out and and when he talks about, you know, you remember a month and a half ago, two months ago, well, you know, it really wasn't why I got out of the game and then yesterday comes out, well, you know, th- this played a really big factor in why I did retire from football. It's like, okay, well, which one is it? And I think we are at a point now where if they don't reel this thing in, and another thing too is they pretty much bashed collective yesterday in a way. If you listened closely, yeah. they bashed collectives and said, we want to get away from this. And, and for the public realizing okay, these collectives have been coming to you for four years now. If you're a donor, if you're a season ticket holder, if you're somebody associated with a program, the collectives have been coming and asking for money, and and that's not a bad thing. The problem here lies in the university side of this, where the university's like, well, wait a minute. These big donors are giving money to the collective, but they've decided to stop giving money to the university when it comes to facilities when it comes to upgrading the 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 football department a stadium that's where that's where you're starting to see the fight now you're yeah. starting to see the fight now between collectives and the athletic departments and that's a reason why also we have gotten to this point of how do we control this and how can we bring this in house and i just think nick saban went up there yesterday god bless him but i i think he went up there yesterday and was kind of a martyr it's like okay let me lay all this down and a lot of people wanted to to say, oh, okay, well, he's doing it for the good of college football. He could be doing anything today. He could be playing golf or hanging out at his new house. It's like he's already had this on the schedule. Like it, it wasn't anything new. I so like I understand what Greg Byrne is talking about with an athletic department deficit. Okay, that's fine. But when your program's bringing in, you know, over two hundred fifty million dollars a year, you know, that's the balance with Title IX. When it comes to eliminate, he, you know, he talked about eliminating sports. Oh, we're going to have to eliminate sports because we're at a deficit. Let me tell you something. Every college university that is big enough out there with a football program is running at a deficit for your track and field, your rowing, 
your your women's softball, even your college baseball. You could sell out every single game there in, in College Station, but you're still having to pay for travel and whatnot and food and whatnot and, and scholarships and athletes. So you're always running in a deficit. So I just I didn't like that part where it, to me it was a scare tactic more than anything that it was a conversation on how do we fix it. Trey, explain this to me like I'm three because the lack of guardrails, I yeah. get it initially, but you've already said it's what been three and a half years. Like what right. if my kids continue to make mistakes, I change rules and I put guardrails there and then I kind of fix it as I go. Like, all right, now this is the new parameters. There's been zero adjustment and I don't understand why it takes a long time for just some minor mm -hmm. adjustments. Because the NCAA is sick and tired of getting taken to court over every single thing that they do. So you don't have Greg Sankey, and I'll just use Greg Sankey and Tony Petiti as, as the guys because of their alliance. Um, you don't have conferences coming out and laying out guardrails when it comes to NIL. Um, so when when that's the case, I mean, look at look at look at what happened a couple months ago. Multiple players can transfer now. You know, you got multiple transfers now. So you can go from one school in the fall, next school in the spring, you're good to go. They decided to let that through because they don't want to fight this in court. So the NCAA has gotten to a point where, man, we just don't feel like dealing with this anymore. So you guys kind of figure out which way this thing is going to go. And when you had that judge in East Tennessee, and I was in that courtroom when the NCAA was battling Tennessee and Virginia over this injunction, when you had him grant the injunction that allowed NILs to sit here and talk about figures with these players, which that's how America works, by the way. You know, you want to get a player, that player wants to know how much he's going to make when he gets there. He don't want to know after. He don't know what a ballpark percentage is. He wants to know what he can make. I think the NCAA has thrown their hands up, but they're also sitting off to the side and being like, okay, well, if y'all come up with something, we can still govern this part of it. You just give us the rules and let us kind of take over. Because I think the Congress situation and the government, I, I, I think that's a little far stretched right now because of what I said earlier. There's so much other stuff going on in the country. They don't feel like dealing. You can, you can throw up there Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, whoever you want. God bless them. But you know what? At the end of the day, they work for the constituents and do their constituents really, really care about how much an athlete's getting paid and how they're going to govern it. That's why I think it's going to take a minute before we get something involved with Congress. So you asked about guardrails. There it is. They are all trying to figure out at the same time. How do they handle this situation with there's no rules right now? Technically, it's Let's weird, man. Let's talk about the health of the of, of the game in all games, right? So um, yeah. th there was a report out, and there was a na uh, I think a couple mentions of a particular player, but somebody saying they're going to miss a game unless NIL was ponied up before a game. And NCAA tournaments coming up, and there's transfers potentially that could impact the way the tournament's going to go. The health of the game. Are there going to be? And I think there will be. Fans are like, you know what? This ain't for me anymore because I remember I could watch a program and see a guy grow over two or three years. I don't know if I'm going to have him next semester. It's funny you say that. I got a piece coming out in about 20 minutes, and it's pretty much going at college football officials for trying to scare the fans out of enjoying the football game. Um, you can't tell me there's not going to be 102,000 people show up in College Station on a Saturday for a football game. You can't tell me 100,000 people aren't going to show up in Neyland Stadium, another 20,000 outside the tailgate. When we really break this down, it's still college football, man. I, I know it's heading towards an NFL model, and I understand that. Um, when it comes to to paying these players, but here's what a lot of people forget, and 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 it, I, I don't know if it's being naive or just not wanting to admit that it was happening. Uh, breaking news: these players were getting paid a lot of money before NIL was introduced. So if you're complaining now, why weren't you complaining ten years ago when these kids were getting two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars to attend the school from a bag man or a booster? or the $500 handshakes after the football game? Why is it? It's a big deal now because it's public. And when it's public, it freaks people out. They're like, yeah, even the coaches. Coaches don't want to talk about this. This stuff was handled behind the scenes in the dark rooms and alleys of hotel parking lots. They do not want to be talking about this to the, the media. 
and letting the fans in on the big old secret. Well, the big old secret's out now. You're paying players, and, and you've been doing it for 40 years. This is nothing new. So I think when you look at it from a fan aspect, and I've talked with a couple of people about this, um, trying to gauge different fan bases, and at the end of the day, they just want to be able to show up and want to be able to root for their football team. Um, I, I think, yes, you are going to have some fans that are like, you know what? This is this is a little much for me. Like it feels like more towards a pro model. I don't know if I can cheer for these players. Blah, blah, blah. They can say all that, but then I promise you, when Saturdays come around and their teams hitting the field, and you know it's it's in College Station or Tuscaloosa or in Gainesville, you're still going to show up. And I and I think that's to a point where we got to yesterday, where I think you had a lot of folks trying to scare fans in a way, but. As you'll see, they're not naive, David. They understand. And if you're smart enough college football fan, you know that your star quarterback uh, was getting something before they arrived on campus or getting something when they were on campus. So I, I just I just think it's a double-edged sword. That's what I'm getting at. I, I think that you have to realize it's already been going on. This is just a public way that it's now happening and really – Nothing has changed in the game besides the transfers that are moving around, okay? And then probably the the amount of money has changed and how much these players are getting. But at the end of the day, they're still getting paid the same way that the starting quarterback for, I don't know, the Florida Gators or or or, or the Texas Longhorns are getting paid 12 years ago. It's just in a different model and a different form. So if fans can come around to that, I think they'll be okay. But I do understand, and I totally respect the fans out there that are like, oh, man, this game is kind of moving on a little bit. It's getting in a weird territory. I don't know if I can be a part of it. So it, that part's not lost on me, but I would come back to them and say with that argument, and a damn thing changed in the last 40 years. Trey, I got about 30 seconds to play with here. I just want to – you wrote yeah. recently about mm -hmm. Mo Hassan there at Vanderbilt and, and uh, mobsters coming <laughs> at him. Can you kind of give us the 30, 40-second version of that story? Yeah, Mo Hassan, former Vanderbilt quarterback, played in seven games, said he was at a honky-tonk bar in Nashville while he was playing there, and the Italian mob, I guess a spokesperson for the Italian mob, came up and said, hey, man, we'll give you 300 k to fix this football game. And by the way, just some assurance, you know that we're doing it, uh, we do this in the SEC, and, and we're rigging SEC games as well. Um, I, I, look, I don't know if Mo was doing this for clout. Uh, a part of me says, yeah, it's real. Somebody came up to him and offered him $300,000. Would that surprise me? No. That's the way gambling's done nowadays. It is what it is. You're trying to flip quarterbacks. But at the end of the day, uh, you don't talk about the mob, okay? Don't talk about the mob. That's on you. So whatever happens, God willing, he's okay. <laughs> He did run his mouth first. <laughs> <laughs> Trey, great stuff, man. We'll do it again, all right? Good to see you. Good seeing you too, buddy. All right, Trey Wallace, I'll kick right there. All right, we'll hit a quick break, and we'll come back with a few seconds there at the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. It's TechSax Radio.
Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. By the way, it is the Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. Callie Gardner. Hello. Uh, so Cheerio. Baseball last night. Beat, was it good? It was great. I was nervous, but, you know, sometimes midweeks get that way, and that's okay. I was not expecting to go into that game last night and watch a 12 to nothing blowout. Uh, I kind of figured it would be on the closer side, you know, Sam Houston, they're, they're pretty talented, whether people wanted to believe it or not. They, they have a good baseball club. Um, and we beat them in the second walk off in a game in a row at Bluebell nine to eight. Uh, threw right handers the entire game. You know, I think we're confident in our left-handed starters, uh, in Prager and Lampkin, and then our left-handed bullpens and Austin Beck and Sadeo. Uh, trying to find who can be our righties that we can rely to out of the pen. You know, we've got Chris Cortez, Josh Stewart, Brad Rudis. Um, we were trying to figure out who else. And coach was saying, you know, on I think it was on Monday, uh, not everybody can make the travel roster, and that's just that's just going to happen. Uh, so we're trying to figure out, um, you know, who we can take with us. We've got guys like Braden Montgomery and Jet Johnston who are vital parts of the lineup but can also throw if needed, which is really, really helpful to have as we head to Gainesville this weekend to take on Florida. Um, Aggie baseball face or softball faces their first SEC road test against Mississippi State this weekend. Mississippi State is 19 and four on the season and two and one in SEC play, taking the series from Ole Miss in Oxford last weekend. Uh, Emily Kennedy earned the D1 softball pitcher of the week, and her that was her first career title and is now one of two Aggie pitchers who have won a national weekly award, along with Ryan Prager, who also won the perfect game pitcher of the week. He has been outstanding this season, and we're excited to see him. Uh, take on the Florida lineup that they have. Uh, men's tennis takes on UT RGV today at noon before taking on top-ranked Ohio State at 6 p.m. And they have two SEC matchups this weekend in Tennessee on Friday and Georgia on Sunday. And all of those games are in College Station. Okay, so. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. When we come back on Texas Radio, John Harris, Texans had a busy day. We'll get into that. We've got some college football stuff to get into with him and much, much more. It is Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
Breaking news. Texas A&M is going to name Nebraska AD Trev Alberts as his new AD. We'll get into that. Billy will be joining us, I believe, at 10 o'clock. We'll move the schedule around a little bit. So we'll more of that. And uh, we'll break it all down here on Texax Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's go straight to the hotline. We're joined by John Harris from uh, footballtakeover.com and, of course, Texas sideline reporter. Johnny, good morning, buddy. Uh, good morning. Wow. I'm just <laughs> reacting Big news. Uh, to that news. That's that's ma- that's massive massive news. Um, it's to end up with an athletic director, Trev Alberts. Wow, um, especially getting him out of Nebraska. Um, I mean, wow, that's a that's a big move. I, listen, I can't speak to Trev Alberts as an athletic director, um, but I do feel like there are certain times, and I feel like this happens in in all businesses, but. It happens in our business. It happens, I think, at that level, too. Obviously, your results speak for themselves. You know, if you've been at a certain place for a while, um, you've been an athletic director for a while, you've got a track record, um, and that can speak for itself. But names that you know matter. And Trev Alberts, this All-American football player from Nebraska, Names matter. I mean, when you hear Trev Alberts, the first thought is, oh, man, played in Nebraska, All-American. Boy, he must really know this. He played in the NFL. He must really know this. I'm not saying whether Trev Alberts is a great AD or not. I have no idea. But that name recognition will absolutely help um, in that regard, um, especially because he's got such a I, – I don't think it's a long tenure as the athletic director, I don't think, at Nebraska. So um, that name recognition definitely helps – um, it helps a lot in my business, and I, there's, there's, it's a two. Obviously, it's a two-sided coin. Yeah, it's name recognition it doesn't always mean the guy's going to end up being great. I'm not saying that about Trev Alberts, um, but it, at least for a guy that doesn't have a long track record as athletic director, it definitely helps. So um, that's an. It's going to be wow. I'm. Whew. Interesting news, David. Interesting yeah, interesting news. A couple things. He's only 53 years old. Um, he yep. had been at Nebraska since 2021. Uh, but before that, he was at the Nebraska Omaha in 2009 before going to Lincoln there in 2021. Uh, he was following uh, Bill Moss's retirement. So there you go. Uh, Trev Albert's going to be the uh, new AD here at uh, Texas A&M. Billy Lucci will be with us in the 10 o'clock hour to uh, break it all down. He had kind of been hinting that this was getting close um, uh, Saturday at our Angry Elephant event and then on Monday as well here on the program. All right, Johnny, uh, interesting 24 hours or 36 hours for the Texans. Let's uh, let's talk about it from your perspective because people are like, Texans aren't doing anything. And then they did a bunch yesterday. Are you trying to get me mad? Are you trying to get me mad and talk about all the fans that are panicking about Saquon Barkley choosing to stay in his home state? Because that's that's what I heard a lot on day one. And it and it you know me, David. It great it graded my ever love and just it, it graded my nerves. Um you know, two of the best moves the Texans have made in the last, you know, last, you know, calendar year basically happened on the same day when we were able to sign Devin Singletary and Dalton Schultz to one year contracts. De- Devin was like one for two and a half million, and Dalton Schultz was like one for six. That happened like 10 days into free agency. It's like that, those were massive situations for the Texans. And I'm like, why? People are panicking. And, I, I kept saying it, you know, night one got in the air and people have just lost their minds. I thought good Aggie John Lopez was going to absolutely go over the edge <laughs> all because the Texans hadn't signed a running back. And I'm like, do you guys pay attention? Like running backs, I hate to say it, are the most disposable um, commodity in the NFL. And I know the Texans say we want to run the ball. And look, I want a running back too. But I'm like, just because Saquon Barkley chose to stay home, basically, to face the Giants twice a year to get more money, oh, the Texans were this absolute failure. And I'm like, man, just give it give it more than 24 hours. Well, at 6.20 that night, as we we're about to go to a break, I see the news on Twitter that the Texans have signed Aziz Alshire from the Tennessee Titans. Oh, not a running back one of the better run-stuffing linebackers in the league and better than anybody at this point the Texans have. Now, I think Christian Harris is going to be that guy, but he's, he's not there yet. 
but Aziz knew D'Amico from San Francisco. And all of a sudden, okay, wow. Then in the morning, you trade for Joe Mixon. Okay, you got your running back. Calm down. And then at about 5.30, last night, the big bomb dropped with Daniel Hunter coming from the Minnesota Vikings. And, you know, it's interesting because I feel like free agency and, and recruiting are kind of, they're kind of similar. And I think, you know, fans, ardent followers of both get amped up about who it is they want or who they think the Aggies should go get or who the Texans should go get. And that's awesome. But in college, you're dealing with, okay, we only have got X number of scholarships to give. In the NFL, you're dealing with, well, we've got this much on the salary cap that we can give. And in both cases, you know, over the last few years, like, you know, with Jimbo, they were going, you know, signing guys from all over the place. It was like, yes, we're getting all these guys. I don't know where it put the Aggies. I think there's a difference in the way that Elko is maybe putting the team together that, hey, maybe we don't need a five-star guy that is going to be all about the NIL collective and it's going to be a three-star guy that we know we can develop and turn into a five-star player that wants to be at Texas A&M. And I feel like that's kind of what the Texans with the salary cap. It's like, go spend our money, Nick. <laughs> or it's more like, go spend your money. And it's so tough because it's like, yo, it's not as simple as saying, well, I'm going to sign Saquon Barkley and this guy because we have $70 million of cap space and we're going to go sign these two guys and that fits under the cap. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The cap is not a static thing. The cap ends up being fluid. You need, you're need you going to need money down the road. What happens if a couple guys get hurt? you got to go sign players. you got to do all those kind of things. So Nick had money. He just wasn't spending it the way that people thought on day one. And because they didn't do it on day one, people were freaking out. So my tweet last night, as somebody said, yeah, passive aggressive. Well, I couldn't tag everybody I should have tagged because it would have been too many people on Twitter. But I basically said the Texas defense added Nico Autry, Aziz Alshire, Daniel Hunter, the top defensive end, um, top defensive end free agent, Jeff Okuda, and Foley Fatukasi. They did that in the first 36 hours of free agency. And everybody wanted it done in the first 30 minutes. It's like, calm down. Relax. You're going to get there. Because guess what? Now you got to go on the radio or you got to write your articles or go on Twitter today. And now you got to backtrack. Now you got to go say, hmm, okay, maybe Nick was smart. And here you are blasting him all over the city of Houston. It's ridiculous. Sorry, David. Stepped on a minefield. Well, let's see if I can continue that dialogue in, in a different oh, way. Joel Klatt seems to, I can't use the word I want to use. He doesn't talk kindly of A&M, and it's not just during the Jimbo era. But this is not about A&M. This is a, a headline that I read today. Joel Klatt claims that Dallas Turner could have a higher NFL ceiling than Will Anderson. Um, I like Dallas <laughs> Turner. I don't think he's Will Anderson, but I'll let you take it from there, Johnny. <laughs> Good luck, pal. Good luck, pal. I mean, Dallas Turner's I mean, look, a nice player, for sure. Look, there, there there's a there's a, a whiff of of truth in this and this only. Dallas Turner is probably a little bit quicker, a little bit more agile, a little bit twitchier. Can probably play the outside linebacker role maybe a little bit better. But Joe Klatt has never been in a locker room or been on a practice field, or been on the sidelines for a game in which Will Anderson is playing. Will Anderson, the entire package of Will Anderson is what you get when you draft Will Anderson. I'm going to tell you a story that I heard. I heard this from a couple of people, actually. Will Anderson was in a special teams meeting. All-American Will Anderson was in a special teams meeting at Alabama. A freshman rolled in like two, three minutes late. Door open. Freshman came rolling in. Will sitting in the front seat like he always does. Will Anderson looked at the coach, kind of nodded. Will Anderson walked over to the kid, tossed him out of the meeting. Like in college. He's the ultimate alpha. He is the, I mean, he had two sacks of Ryan Tannehill, good ag. 
um, with an ankle he probably shouldn't have been playing on. Back-to-back sacks that kept the Titans from a field goal in our second matchup with him. Shouldn't have been on the field. He's playing with a high ankle sprain. He's somehow gutting it out. Dallas Turner may have more, quote-unquote, athletic ability, but Will Anderson took over games in college. Dallas Turner had some nice ball games. I think highly of Dallas Turner. I had Will Anderson rated way higher because as a football player, as a leader, that's a guy that I've got to have in my locker room. Dallas Turner's fine. I mean, I think he's he's a really, really good player. And Joe Clyde might be right down the road. That's a clown show thing to say, to be honest, because Will Anderson Jr. and Dallas Turner were there at the same time. And who do you think teams were more worried about on a down-in, down-out basis? Will Anderson Jr. So Dallas Turner come to the league. He'll be a top seven pick. That'd be fine. Um, but one of the reasons the Texans traded up last year is because they looked at the defensive crop this year and said, there isn't a Will Anderson in that draft. And who does this draft include? Dallas Turner. So have fun, Joe Clatt. We'll talk to you in a few years. Talking to John Harris here on Texax Radio, presented by David Garner's jeweler. Johnny, did you get to watch Nick Saban yesterday on Capitol Hill? <laughs> I heard about it. Uh, I didn't get a chance to watch it. I mean, it, I, but I heard, I heard some of the things he's saying. And I think what he's saying can get twisted in a lot of different ways. Because I saw a lot of people, I saw one of my friends, uh, who was radio host in South Carolina, tweeted a picture of his lake house and was like, oh, yeah, Nick wasn't, you know, it was okay for the coaches to be making all the money, but the players not to be. I think what Nick is saying is like, look, the players should be getting a piece of piece of the pie. This is at least the way that I read it. The players should be getting a piece of the pie. But it's now gotten to a point where the only thing that they're looking at has nothing to do with their development as a football player, their development as a scholar athlete, and none of it. It all is. What's my bag? And if Nick's saying that at Alabama, you know what's happening in a lot of other places too. And I don't know if that's – I think because a kid ends up asking for money or wanting a new new contract, as I say in air quotes, or whatever, I don't think it means entirely that he's not thinking about football. But – it's hard for a coach to look at that and go, hey, coach, I want $5 million this year. Coach is like, we don't have an NI collective. Okay, well, I'm going to transfer for them. It's hard for a coach to not assume that's, okay, well, this is what they're all asking for. So there's a, to me, there's a, there's a, I, I get where Nick is coming from, to be honest. Um, I think, I feel like, Nick wants the players to get a piece of the pie, but I think Nick kind of wanted his cake and eat it too, and that is once you open up Pandora's box to say, oh, these kids can go out and get their NIL money, and this is the way it's going to be. This is the way college football is going to uh, essentially run its business. Well, you're setting, you're setting yourself up for kids coming in and saying, hey, I want a new deal. Now, again, I don't think it's just kids aren't thinking totally about football, but it could be wrong. I mean, Nick obviously has a closer relationship with those players than not. But I think underlying all of that, it's not saying, hey, don't play players. But I think it's, hey, let's get a handle on what and how we kind of use and put all of this together so that we don't turn into the NFL. When, in fact, I think that's where we're going is it's turning into the college version of the NFL. So um, what were your thoughts about it? What do you think when you listen to him? You know, when I, I hear Nick, it's interesting. My opinion changes based on the situation. Like uh, when he's talking about a and not that he's done a lot of that, but the whole Jimbo thing, I, I, you know, I thought he was out of line, but also was trying to drum up interest from his boosters and all the things that he was complaining about, he took advantage of, which I don't think makes him guilty of anything, right? Like I think he right. saw... This is the direction we're going for me to stay the goat. I've got to adjust, even though I don't like adjusting to this. Um, right. You know, and, and Johnny, like, I, I, I try to use, I don't want to say real world issues, but like my life. I don't like social media, Johnny. I don't. But it's the necessary yeah. evil of this business. Right. 
Um, I don't do it well. I don't even do it very much. But you have to, right? And I think that's kind of what Nick was saying. He was giving us, you know, his his blurbs throughout the last few years. Um, this is what I think is going to happen. This is what I'm, but I'm also going to do it great and and show you the playbook of how to do it. Uh, my my whole thing is was yesterday just a dog and pony show. What's the point of having it if nothing's going to come out yeah. of it? Ted Cruz yesterday says fifty fifty chance. It ain't going to get fixed in the next couple of months before the election. We know that's not going to change. No, I mean that's one of the reasons that people my interpretation of it a lot one of my reasons or one of the things that i think that people want is their sports to say stay separate from their politics um there's some that don't some that do um but when you see nick saban longtime football coach sitting right next to congressman ted cruz and you're like here we go we're dipping peanut butter into chocolate now some people don't mind a peanut butter and a chocolate, but I don't know how many times you get on Twitter. It's like, hey, stick to sports because people want to see sports as that escape. You know, this is what I look forward to. I look forward to my 12 a.m. games in the fall, playoff games, bowl games, et cetera. Hopefully there are playoff games coming. So I think people look at sports as an escape and don't want the, the, the politicians to be part of it in any way, shape, or form. The problem is that the NCAA has not done the impossible job of trying to keep all of this contained. David, you got how many kids? Four. Well, let's take it this way. You had, you had twins. I, I, I know that. The twins early on. When you have one child early on, it's like, man, you're doing everything possible because you got that one child early on. And all of a sudden, you go to two right out of the bat because you got twins, it's like overwhelming. And you're just doing everything possible to play man-to-man on those two kids between you and your wife. And your wife does it probably better than you. But it, it's, it, you're just doing everything possible. I don't care. Uh, McDonald's tonight. You might be against McDonald's, but you're like, I can't breathe. I got to get on my Happy Meal or I'm going to die. Um, that's kind of the way I think it happened out of, after NIL. NIL exploded one year or two years after the transfer portal really became a thing. And now all of a sudden the NCAA is trying to keep up, you know, a handle on it and they can't do it. So they're calling in, you know, the cleaner, they're calling in the politicians to try and help, like help us because we can't really help ourselves. It, it may be a situation that the NCAA could never or would never be prepared for. So I don't know how much can change. And how much could change soon? Um, and I don't know what that. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe the maybe the genie's out of the bottle. And we can't get her to go back in, man. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. If there's any way of going back. I think there's just adaptation. And I'll go back to this. I've said this before. Back in the '40s or '50s, scholarships were were a weird thing. When scholarships were introduced at universities. It might have been a little bit earlier than that, but the point being, for a long time, there weren't there weren't athletic scholarships. But now could you I mean, think about the world we live in. I mean, scholarship is a is a huge goal attainable by a lot of high school students to go get a free education and and maybe beyond that. So we got to just change our thinking in some sense. And maybe this becomes the norm. I just would like to see if this is the norm. Just kind of get a handle on it. You know, some of the things that go on, I mean, just listen to Lane Kiffin. Of all things, I never thought I would ever say that Lane Kiffin is the voice that we should be listening to. But when you listen to Lane, he's like, I hate this. I think this is stupid. I think it's ridiculous. I think it is, you know, way over the top. But them's the rules. And I'm going to abide by them. It's like, you know, it's crazy. Lane Kiffin is kind of the, the conscience um and the voice in this whole thing but he's but he's right and that's what i think old, older coaches are having a hard time like well back in my day yeah older coaches having a hard time because it's not back in your day i've seen this happen in business too i saw it happen in accounting after all the enron scandals also the county put in all these different rules and all these different things that we had to do and it was overboard and a lot of older partners were like done give me my early retirement i'm out of here i'm not doing that they didn't want to change to that. But the younger ones, like, man, we're forced to change. 
or or leave for a different business, which I did. Um, so you just adapt, and that's what Lane Kiffin is saying. It's not good. It's bad. It's just a horrible way of doing things. But because that's the way business is being done, I'm going to go do that the best I know how. And that's why he's successful in taking in how many ever how many ever players he was able to bring in into the collective, which amazingly all came from the FCC. John, I got to hit a break here, but you said uh, fans don't really like for the politics, or some don't like politics and sports mixing. But uh, I just got to tell you what I read: RFK and Aaron Rodgers as a presidential ticket. Just want to see your your eyes more than anything when I say that. I mean that. <laughs> That uh, that just that just kind of proves my point. I mean, really. <laughs> I, I mean, there's nothing else to say. Like, really? Yeah. I mean, really. If Aaron Rodgers wants if, if Aaron Rod. I mean, look, RFK Junior's two potential running mates are as as it was announced was Jesse Ventura <laughs> and Aaron Rodgers Junior. or Aaron Rodgers. I mean, okay. Um, I kind of would rather have candidates. Now, Jesse, Jesse Ventura was the governor of Minnesota back in the late 90s, early 2000s. So he's at least got some political experience. What's Aaron Rodgers' political experience? Talking on a Pat McAfee show? He went on Rogan. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, you know, look, I've said a long time ago, when it comes to radio, I'm not going to tell anybody my religion or my politics because I want people, when they listen to me, I want them to see me. Like, I know football. I'm the guy, hopefully, that people think about when they, well, man, I got a question about football that they think about me, that they're going to ask me that question. They listen to what I have to say for football. I don't give a damn about religion and politics as it pertains to the job I do in the radio. But now those lines are starting to blur, and it's really uncomfortable. Yeah. Especially when Aaron Rodgers as a potential vice president. Oh Not gonna happen. Hey, Kanye ran too. Johnny, appreciate you, brother. That's probably the best way to finish this interview, David. See you, buddy. Yay! He's not running for this one. That's uh, at least you can hear from here. All right, let's hit a break. We'll come back. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about uh, Trev Alberts. Looks to be the uh, new athletic director at Texas A&M. We'll talk about that for a quick minute before Tom Schuberth joins us for a moment, and then of course Billy going to join us at ten o'clock. We've moved Jason Howell to 1035 for a recruiting country. Moment for Caldwell Country Chevrolet, Highway 21 in Caldwell, online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. If you have purchased a vehicle there from Caldwell Country Chevrolet, everything I'm telling you, you're like, yeah, that's true. Yep, that's true. Yeah, that's true. All, and that's true because uh, all the things that I've been saying are, are very true. Great customer service, great people, great pricing, and, of course, a great trade-in value. You put that together, and you're going to walk away saying, pretty good, pretty, pretty good. That's what you get when you go to Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Uh, and I, I bought a Tahoe there a couple years back, and it was phenomenal. It was a, a great – the whole process, I was an annoying customer because, like, it started in February and didn't end up buying in June. But they were cool with it. They knew that I was going to take my time, you know, test drive, get the right car. And it was certainly an incredible experience. And it's not a far drive. We're talking 15 minutes, the very edge of – Brian, to the beginnings of Caldwell. Short conversation away, but you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the good people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 in Caldwell online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com.
Can't hear you. Tech Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. Kelly Gardner's there at the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. She was telling me something, but I had my headphones in, so I couldn't hear her. And you guys heard that. So uh, we're going to go to her here in a minute, but uh, let's just reset the, the big news that broke about, I don't know, 27 minutes ago that uh, Trev Albers is set to be named the new athletic director at uh, Texas A&M. And uh, I think Brett Zornerman had that story initially. Billy obviously was on top of it, um, had it ready to roll. And uh, here we are breaking it down. I'm seeing mixed reactions on the board, which is usually a good thing. And uh, typically, I don't think that people know. Like, this is not a Mark Stoops situation. But I'm looking at everybody. Um, their response is Max Olson from The Athletic. Knew he was in the mix, but absolutely did not believe Trev Alberts would make this move. Stunning, Okay. So to leave your alma mater for Texas A&M, it just tells you the kind of level of job that uh, he, he felt. And let's see what else is out there. I saw a couple other ones that caught my eye. Um, Ross Dellinger. Uh, A&M is targeting Trev Albers as its ne- next athletic director. Deal is not done. Expected it would be a big AD move within the industry. Big in big letters. Big. I think I need Nick to say big. Nick, can you say big the way you say it sometimes? I'm sorry. Uh Big, yeah, like but, but Trump it, big, it, yeah, Trump bigly, big. yeah. How would he say this? This higher? How would he say it? Just it's, give me a line. We're gonna, we're gonna win so much. We're gonna get tired of winning. <laughs> it's big, right? It, bigly, but many people are saying the biggest tire, probably of all time. <laughs> so good, Nick. I love when you do it. All right, let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center, Cali Gardner. What's the people's reaction? Yeah, we've got we've got some definitely some mixed reactions. I've been reading a lot on Twitter. I've I've seen a lot of uh, Nebraska fans who are unhappy about his departure from Nebraska. So that's that's usually a positive thing. Uh, so hopefully we see that play out in our favor. Um, we got some text messages. Dave in the in Washington, in the says, Pacific Northwest. Pacific Northwest says the last time we took an AD from Nebraska, football went into the toilet. So okay, well there you go. It happened once. It has to happen again. Yeah, history repeats itself. So. How about this one from Ag Engineering Twelve on TexAgs.com? I jumped over to Reddit to see how Husker fans are reacting because I know nothing about this guy, and they are melting down. So maybe a good hire. I think so. Callie, what else? Uh, yeah, are we going to do Around the SEC, or we want to stay on? Uh, do we have one one or two more things to read, and then we'll get into Around the SEC quickly? Uh, Chase in Houston says, Trev Alberts, dot, 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 wow. Wow. So I'm not sure how to take that, but we'll see. Well, how about this? I think, uh, was it Bronny or Zane upstairs? I think it was maybe Zane who said this. Somebody said it upstairs, and I agree. Um, do we trust this hire? Do we trust the committee? And a couple of the people on the hiring committee Jim Schlossnagel, Joni Taylor, two of the best hires a has had here over the last few years. So Agreed. if they uh, sign off on this, I'm all in. All right? I, I trust in people who know how to build and people who uh, are good at reading um, through the minutia and, and figuring out what's best for their program. Um, and if those two uh, endorse this, I'm all in. I agree. I think that I, I think you're spot on with that. Uh, Nick's mom chiming in saying she loves it. She it's I, big. It's yeah, for sure. Talking about Nick's impression um, going on there. I don't. Yeah, she don't. definitely was not talking about the AD <laughs> hire. I promise you that. <laughs> she loves the, the the Donald Trump voice. I love it too. All right, let's try to get at one or two quick points on around the SEC. Yeah, so we've got the basketball tournament starting today, the men's tournament in Nashville. Uh, we've got the 11 through 14 seeds playing. Vanderbilt takes on Arkansas, and Missouri takes on Georgia. Uh, D1 baseball, we, I know we talked about it a little bit um, earlier in the show, but their new rankings have uh, the SEC holding four of the top five places, and the West has three of the top four, with Arkansas at one, LSU at two, and AM at four, followed by Tennessee at five, Florida at eight, and Vanderbilt at nine. And I know AM has a tough schedule this year, and I know the rankings change throughout the year, but we take on um, almost all of those teams, uh, except for Tennessee this year. So should be interesting. And Florida has a lot of talent. They're the only team besides UCSB in the top 25 that has five losses. Um, but I think that they're, I think that they're going to figure it out. Uh, so that's what we've got. Thank you, Callie. Appreciate you. When we come back, we're going to talk to Tom Schuberth. We've got the uh, SEC tournament, as she was alluding to here. A&M will play tomorrow. We're looking forward to their rematch against Ole Miss. Hopefully a beatdown and hopefully an invitation to the NCAA tournament. Right now we're talking Millican Reserve. Um, if I'm having like a, a watch party. Well, hopefully 
um, A&M is in, in the SEC championship final. They're in Nashville, and they're what? But if they came back and they wanted to watch it somewhere, but they can be in nature, have an outdoor TV, this doesn't make a lot of sense, but I'm just trying to get to Millican Reserve, and I want them to be relaxed when they're there. And that's what you can do when you go to Millican Reserve, a farm-to-table community in College Station. Homes, trails, wide open spaces, and a mission to build a healthy community around nature. 2,600 acres of open space. It's beautiful out there. They've got uh, farms. They've got 30 miles of trails. They've got homes, and they want to connect families to nature and to each other. They have an extensive network of trails throughout a wooded landscape that includes walking and equestrian paths, and they've got creeks, they've got ponds, they've got gathering areas, and they're committed to maintaining and restoring that amazing natural habitat. And when you go there, you'll see the songbirds, you'll see the rabbits, you'll see the turtles, you'll see everything. I'm sure there's a raccoon out there too, one or two. Got to be. Um, no bears that I've been told of, but you never know. Uh, but they're, they're all living out there. They kind of provide a natural setting for people to connect and come together. Hiking, biking, canoeing, kayaking, equest- equestrian trails, the evening yoga, the summer camps. They have it all out there. Check out the website, millicanreserve.com. That is millicanreserve.com. So I consider Tom Schubert a friend. We've even talked about hanging out, but I got 100 kids, so we never get to hang out. But it's going to happen at some point. So when I joke with you, that means I, I like you. I care for you. And what did I say when you walked in? Yeah, I look like I'm in the mafia. Because <laughs> he's got the jumpsuit on. Like I, Usually he's in a suit or like, you know, like, and he walked in like a coach or Tony Soprano. I wasn't sure which one. 
Maybe a combination of both. I don't know. There's a lot of good Italian coaches out there. At least my mom used to say that, you know. So uh, it's a it's a good. I guess it's a compliment. It's a to compliment. me. It is. I'm I'm proud of my heritage, and I think everybody should be. You know, it's, that's what how God made us. So Absolutely. That's, that's what's wonderful. Well, Tom, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about this team because we're at a point where put up or shut up, right? Like, and they're putting up. They got to do it again a couple more times. Mm-hmm. Just your thoughts on how they've been playing here the last couple of weeks. I like you said a couple more times. That's my belief. I think if they go into the tournament tomorrow and beat Ole Miss, which I hope they do, uh, I think they have to beat Kentucky. That's my opinion. Again. So you think they need two more wins to be in the tournament? I do, because I think the Kentucky win will be so valuable. I think they can beat Kentucky, pack their bags, go home, and are still in a tournament, you know, because nothing better than that can happen. If you were to ask people in the SEC, they'd probably say Kentucky's the hottest team right now. Mm -hmm. So if you end up beating them, uh, it's going to be a great feather in our cap. But you asked how the team was playing. I mean, I think they're doing exactly what they did late last year and early this year when they were playing good teams. They're finding a way to win, and they're doing it any way they have to. You know, Manny Obacity is stepping up. You know, their defense is picked back up. Their energy level uh, when I watched the Ole Miss game, I was like, like dumbfounded how bad Ole Miss looked and how great the Aggies looked. Not because they looked great, just it seemed like Ole Miss didn't even want to be there. Right. And that is a little scary because they do have a very experienced and good basketball coach. And I, I know maybe a fan wouldn't understand this or maybe doesn't believe it, but I think you would rather play a team when they play well against you in a game and you have them a week later than if you beat the living daylights out of them because if that coach is good, he's going to have them ready. Those practices are intense. Uh, those guys were embarrassed. And if they have any hope of making a tournament, Ole Miss, that is, they're, they're going to have to obviously win the first one, and they'll probably have to win two or three to advance and get a chance to play in the NCAA. I want to go back to something you said because I think when you said they need to at least two more to get in, I get that. But I also think it's unfair that they have to do that for public opinion based on what I think other programs have done. So when you look at some of the teams that are considered in today and some of the teams that they're around, Mississippi State's in the middle of a losing streak, right? Um, and they lost to a and They're considered in. St. John's had a resurrection, you know, after Rick Pitino called them all out. But their resume is not better than A&M's. While I don't think A&M's resume should put them in today if they win tomorrow, I think it should. Uh, I also think, what about the other teams around them? And what have they done? Have they beat any top 10 teams? Did they beat Iowa State? Did they go toe-to-toe? Uh, Mississippi State, one of the things you keep hearing about them is, you know, they had to play some games without some of their best players. What do you think of an A&M? You, you should be uh, the spokesperson for A&M. I totally agree. If there's one negative I think that the Aggies had, they had some really bad losses. Mm-hmm. And that's what hurts you. And I think we talked about it earlier. It seems like a bad loss is uh, weighs a lot worse than having a really – quad one win and and I can see that you know in the committee's eyes and then we did have that five game losing streak however we've kind of balanced that out by getting on a roll but the teams that usually are losing in the late February and March very seldom if they're on the bubble do they get the favorable vote and get in the tournament so where we've been the reverse of that the last few years where we've played our best ball but uh yeah David you know I I said it before the NCAA they they're they're a weird bunch, you know. It seems like anything that makes sense, they go the opposite direction. At one time, you know, there's no way we were going to ever be out of the tournament. And then like seven, eight days later, you know, we're not even on the bubble. Right. So it's it's kind of crazy. I, I don't like the volatility of that. But uh, I also think that's what makes it exciting and Sunday very nerve-wracking for about, you know, 50 teams in the country. Well, let's talk about the guy that I think has – brought back Boots and Wade, right? And that's his name is Manny Obasaki. What are you seeing from him from a coaching perspective? Obviously, he's athletic. Obviously, he can get to the rim. He's hitting threes, which I didn't think he could do, but he's doing it. Uh, what, what, but how are they using him? Well, you said it earlier, so you should have maybe been coaching a little, about two months ago. You, you like taking Wade and Boots off the ball some, yep. and you said, you said it five, six shows ago. We need a guard to come in and do that. And we both were scared about Manny because of his – he's kind of shaky with the yep. ball sometimes. You know, he's so herky-jerky. But 
they did exactly what you said was the formula, and they, they've done it to perfection. Manny's been unreal, and so now Wade and Boots are kind of playing loose, and now they're uh, not really the second and third option on the offense, but at times it has been that way. And then Manny's making his threes, which then makes him really dangerous, and then he's scoring at the rim. So uh, if they continue to do that, they could beat Kentucky. I really believe that. Yeah, they got to beat Ole Miss first. Uh, there right? you go. Yes, and, sir. And as a coach, I asked Buzz this, and you know, he 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 had no complaints about obviously how can you have a complaint when you blow out Ole Miss on the road but the the part the the Aggie me the, that I worry about is like you just beat that team down they got a great coach they actually had a lot of success midway through the first half coming back they're gonna ad- adopt some of that right and they're gonna use it I would assume so like after you blow out a team as a coach like how do you coach them against a team that you know it's going to be better than what you saw. Absolutely. That's what we referred to earlier. It's scary because you, there's not really a formula other than you got to remind your guys what they did there. But uh, when I watched that game, I thought like Ole Miss had money on the game betting against them. I mean, it just didn't see any energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the skill level part, you know, you're going to miss shots or turn the ball over. But it was like the loose balls, the 50-50 balls, the, you know, the rebounding. There was no effort, uh, shot selection, which is typically what Ole Miss was good at. So I think you'll see a whole different team. I'm sure it's going to be a – I predicted the game at Oxford to be a, like a, a war and come down to the last possession. And the SEC tournament, you know, you re, re, revitalize because it's a second season. And then they they want to not be embarrassed. I mean, they're going to – if they get beat by the Aggies, Ole Miss, that's how their season's going to be remembered. They'll be in the NIT, of course, but, uh, you know, it's not going to leave a good taste in their mouth. So I'm anxious to see how Coach Beard – reacts and I know Buzz will have the guys ready but it's it's scary because what do you do you know you can't do any better than they were so I wish I had the answer you're just hoping your guys know they're for real and they come out ready to play this is what you do you do what you've been doing and I'm I'm not talking about hitting the threes although I like it you know I don't like when they shoot too many but when they're making them I'm like whatever (laughs) but rebounding putbacks um, transitional defense like those kind of things that they've been doing again better there was a little lull not that their defense was bad but it wasn't like they weren't winning almost every possession. They weren't out hustling everybody. They seemed tired, and I think they seemed tired because Wade seemed tired. But I'm seeing uh, they, they've got that energy back. Maybe it's the, the word I'm looking for. They're winning. They're getting the hustle points again. Absolutely. I think the energy is the, the perfect word. Uh, you know, it, it, they look like a whole different team. Yeah, the Aggies to me, and I, I was proud of it. I mean, I yeah. was so, so surprised, and I kept thinking, well, I watched the timeout one time when they kept it on and didn't go to commercial. I watched Chris Beard talking to his team, and he was almost uh, like pleading with them. I mean, he didn't really get it. It would have been one of those moments that you're watching a game and you know the coach is going to rip into him. And I think he was almost, and I'm not talking negatively about any coach, but he was almost like he was scared to say something and raise his voice because the kids might even quit further, you know, or ask to come out of the game. So sometimes you almost feel paralyzed when you're in that huddle and your guys aren't responding, and and that's what it seemed like. But a lot had to do with the way the Aggies just brought energy, and we we got off to that great start. It kept building. I kept thinking, well, maybe they were going to let him back in the game, and then when it got to that one point, about 18 points, I said, it's over. It doesn't matter – we miss shots, whatever, yeah. we're going to win. So that's a great feeling. I know the, the Aggies are happy, and uh, obviously if the committee saw the score, that's a, a really good thing for our, our selection uh, Sunday. Let's do a break. We'll come back with more. Sound good? It's perfect. Tom Schubert next here. Well, he's here. He's going to stay here. <laughs> he's here every time uh, we ask for him to come here. Is this the most awkward exit we've had? <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, it's bad. It's bad. We'll be back here in a few. It's Tech Sacks. Hey, I'm sorry about the course. You normally, like awesome. last, yeah, I talk.
Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. So I was talking to Tom earlier, um, just a little Aggie notes here, not Aggie basketball related per se, but uh, Joseph Jones was the coach of the year. He did great there at Tarleton. Uh, but you were telling me that uh, Coach Gillespie's still very, very involved. He's just not there on game days. Correct. He he's, uh, prepares the team in practice. He's around the team. But when they go on road games or when they're playing at home, he's just not on the bench coaching. So it's kind of like uh, – you know, that happens in football a lot. You know, how the head football coach just organizes everything and lets his people do it. So he's fully involved and enjoying it, and he's healthy, you know, for the most part. I mean, I don't think he's 100%, but uh, Is this going to be well. the plan moving forward, or at some point he'll start going on those road trips again? Uh, I don't know. This season I don't think he'll ever travel, but yeah. uh, he's hoping, I think, to get healthy enough where he can go full force next year. Uh, the rumor is, and I don't think he'd mind me sharing it, that his, he's got a contract extension. His contract expired, I think, at the end of this month. So he'll be back there. And, and of course, Joseph Jones is a great player here. And that's that's so nice to see that a guy gets coach of the year. You know, a coach starting in the middle of the season and yeah. it did a phenomenal run. They won like 11 games in a row and they almost won the championship. Grand Canyon ended up winning who had a very good team. He uh, Billy's one of those guys that uh... – I wish he would have stayed, obviously, at the time. <laughs> but then in retrospect, I think maybe his career would be looked at differently. You know, like uh, he, they would have built statues of him here at A&M had he stayed. Absolutely. You know, I think uh, most coaches would tell you, and Billy probably would, that he does better with uh, guys like yourself. I mean, like overachievers, guys that want to – you know, do anything it t- takes to win. The more talent, kind of a Buzz has, Williams team kind yeah, of mentality. A- absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I think they're both very similar. You need that type of player to be successful because he's going to drive you every second of every day all year long. You know, he's not going to let up in the off season. He expects you to, you know, bring it every day. And those type of coaches, you know, aren't quite quite as popular this year because of the the culture. Yeah. But he's he's doing a great job. You know, he failed at Kentucky. You would say right. Yeah. And he failed. Really Really bad at uh, Texas Tech, Tech, yeah, yeah. and uh, so and then, but he's done great. You know, he went to Ranger Junior College and, and played Were for you, a national championship yeah. a couple times. You know that that they didn't even have winning seasons before he got there, and then he's turned Tar- Tarleton into a, a, a perennial power in uh, mid-major basketball. It takes a particular type of coach to, or excuse me, a particular type of player to play in that kind of system. You have to be okay with coaching. You have to be okay being yelled at. Um, and in today's college sports landscape, it's it's hard to find that. I think not that Buzz yells, but I think I think Buzz has those kind of guys that don't mind being coached and 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 are okay with the role uh, that they have been assigned. And and they're they're hard to find. And but when you get one, and then you get a guy that's overachieving, or you know you you evaluated them better than everybody else, and they're talented. That's when you're playing for yeah. championships. And I think both coaches do that. And I'm amazed how like I think we talked about it. Buzz doesn't yell at the guys. You know I I mean I don't like yelling as a coach, and I don't like the screamers either. But uh, every now and then you have to but he's so positive and that's what makes him unique and effective absolutely all right so let's uh let's close out with a couple thoughts the fact that henry coleman played a little bit makes me feel so much better going into the sec term because not that i expect henry to be the henry we saw earlier in the year although we'd love to see it Mm -hmm. right but the depth um the veteran the you know he's played in meaningful games just getting one of your guys back when you're going to need him especially I would assume a short bench, and if you keep winning, you might need more help. For sure. You know, four games in four days, you have to win. Think about this. Ole Miss, who's a good team. Then you got to play, if you beat Kentucky, then you're going to probably play the winner of Florida and Alabama. And then if you win that, you might face Tennessee. I mean, that's that's like about as hard a schedule as you could pick in college basketball if you were to take teams. I mean, because they're all good, talented, and they're playing well. So, if they go undefeated, David, we'll win the national. Ch- I mean, if we win the SEC championship, we'll win the national championship. That's how I feel. <laughs> I'm just gonna look at you for a second. I mean, come on, Tom. Well, I mean, think hey, I about hope that. so. Like, I'm not saying Kentucky, Florida, Alabama, Tennessee. You know, and you you beat them, like you said, uh, with kind of a banged up team. Four days and uh, four games in four days. That's not easy. But hey, we've done some surprising things. All right, so here's the deal: you beat Ole Miss, and you're like, God, I got scoreboard. We won two of three, and we blew you out. Then you beat Kentucky, ha-ha, hottest team in basketball. We beat you twice this year. Bam. Then you take on Alabama, potentially, and they blew you out or it was not a good game. And you get revenge against them. (laughs) And then it's Tennessee. 
If it's Tennessee, then Tennessee. You, you know, already beat them. I know. Well, uh, what's our record in the SEC championship the last two years? 0 2. So I'd say we go 0 3. That's what I'm saying. If we win the SEC championship, we're going to win the national and, championship. And it's, yeah. No, well, <laughs> we can dream, right? Right, right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. When we come back on Tech Sags Radio, Billy Lucci should be in studio. We're going to talk about Trev Alberts. Uh, looking like he's going to be the new athletic director for A&M. Get his uh, thoughts on how it all came down and what the future is going to look like. We'll get to your text messages. We'll hear from Jason Howe in Recruiting Country at 1035. We'll get to it next on Tech Sags Radio. Tex Ags Radio. 
presented by David Carter's Jewelers here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. Uh, let me tell you about Rollo Insurance. They are the official insurance provider of Texag's radio. The difference is real. They're an independent insurance company built around educating you on exactly what you're paying for, doing the shopping for you so that you can accomplish all of your insurance goals. They can write any form of insurance to anyone in Texas and several other states. And they've got uh, 45 offices, or actually more than that now, here in the great state of Texas. Their headquarters is on Highway 6 here in College Station. Call them up, 888-44-ROLLO, or go to Rollo Insurance. Insurance.com. All right, so a couple things. Trev Alberts set to be named the, uh, looks like Billy will be here in five minutes, guys. So I just got a, a text from Billy. But it looks like Trev Alberts is set to be the uh, athletic director here at Texas A&M. I'd like to get your thoughts on it as we wait for Billy. What do you think? I think none of us know how to evaluate, um, you know, athletic director. Here's, here's some of the parameters I would use. How are the programs that he's coming from doing? That's, that's A. How has he hired B? Um, what are the fa- what does the fan base think about it? Right? Are they are they like clapping? Like what was the fan base doing when Ross left? What's what the fan base doing when whoever leaves? Right? Um, you know, how do they react to it? And from all indications on social media, it looks like uh, Nebraska fans are upset that he's leaving. So that tells you something. When people are like, "All right, he can go. I don't care," that tells you something else. But when they're like, "Oh no, what are we gonna do?" that that kind of paints a picture for you. Also, um, we just had Tom Schubert on the air, and he said if they win the SEC tournament, they're winning the national championship. That is a lot of optimism right there. Ag Engineering 12 on uh, TechSag says, if you mixed OB's BAS on hoops with Tom's Kool-Aid, we might find a nice middle ground. Isn't that the case? Um, look, just win against Ole Miss, we'll breathe. And Because you know, Tom asked me before he left, he like, what do you think? And I'm like, look, I own, I'm only worried because I'm an Aggie and also because, like, you just blew out this team. You absolutely just blew them out. How do you, like, what do you do for an encore? Well, that's the next team you're going to face again. They were 9-9 nine and nine in conference for a reason, which means they win some, they lose some. So that's the only reason I'm worried. But the way that they're playing right now, the eyeball test that we talk about, that we saw heading into some of the games where they ended up winning, um, you know, like you saw things, certain things that made you think, all right, they're doing this again. They're doing that again. And, oh, by the way, Wade scored enough to be above his season average. I'm good. So if, if we're getting that kind of Texas A&M team, I feel very confident. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. How are people reacting uh, to, the, uh, to the hire? Yeah, I think there's a lot of optimism and excitement around the hire. Um, Walker in Houston says, I have a buddy who is an AD who has held roles in the SEC and the ACC and thinks the AD hire is very solid. Great guy, apparently. Walker, you have an athletic director friend? How come you haven't told me about it? And what's his phone number? Can I get him on the show? Is he a good insight? Come on, man. If he's an SEC athletic director, come on. Hook the show up. Just saying, Walker, we got you. What else? Uh, This one's a a long one, so stay with me here. But Jim and Temple says college football players have been getting paid a long time, well before NIL, has been widespread. Every school has a bag man. A former OK State Cowboy player, a starter from 10 to 20 years ago, said one day after practice he came in, opened his locker, and found stacks of $100 bills taped to his shower shoes. This stuff went on regularly, courtesy of a bag man. Also said the starters got larger amounts than the backups in Stillwater. From Gem and Temple. I wasn't surprised to hear about that. By the way, congrats to AM for bringing Trev Alberts aboard. I recall him as a former Nebraska Husker, Husker star player from the past years. A couple things, Jim. Appreciate your insight. I knew that. Uh, it's not breaking news that college football players were paid before and college athletes. That's, that's not the part that I was wondering how fans are going to react. I think you're, you're alluding to when I was talking to Trey Wallace about the future of college sports, right? Um, that all being said, what I'm complaining about is first off, now that it's public and now that everybody's doing it, the numbers are ridiculous. And everybody, like, there was a time, like, yeah, you're starting quarterback, linebacker, you know, certain key players are getting paid. We're talking about everybody getting paid right now, which I I, I like that everybody's getting a little bit or most people are getting a little bit. But we're talking about the transfer era during the NIL era. You You can transfer multiple times during this era and get bags of money for it, and that's what's going to be. Like That's the part I have a problem with, uh, and that's the part I think fans have a problem with at the same time. Like, If you're an old-school college football yeah, he's right. If your team's got a chance to win, Kyle Field's going to have 102,000, and we're a different kind of university. I'm talking about everybody else. Like the, 
for many college football fans, knowing who your team is for the next two to three years matters, right? Not knowing who you're, who you're going to have at quarterback next semester because of the portal sucks, right? And leaving, you know, you're a Heisman Trophy winner and you decide to leave because somebody else is going to pay you more. I, I, I just don't like the multiple times of it. And that was more my point. What else, uh, Callie? Uh, that's pretty much all I'm seeing on the text line. Did we get to Eric, uh, the bartenders? Because I think he had a Nick oh. Saban thought right there. Oh, did, oh yes, yes, yes. Um, Eric, the bartender, says, to me, it's just Saban trying to play level a playing field that he knows the state of Alabama can't compete with the state of Texas. Look at the economies in both states. No way Alabama has the money to compete long term. So he's trying to save his program by promoting revenue sharing. It's his Hail Mary so he can go back to his state and his family can sell more cars. Uh, sure. Um, I, the bottom line is this model is not a, a sustainable model, and we've been saying it, yet it's, a, it's been sustained for three years, right? Like it has been sustained. I don't like it. Nobody, I don't know about nobody, but it's not where it should be, and they, they, they've got to fix it. Uh, but are they going to fix it? This, like, I would, when you hear Ted Cruz saying 50 50 chance that they, you know, there's some legislation on it here by the time the election, it's not going to happen, guys. It, I just wish it, it didn't take so long. Like, come up with a plan, move on. And this is what it should be like. And if it, it means you have to start paying players and there's a salary cap and there's trade, I don't know how they would make it work. Then it becomes the NFL, just a different version with college football helmets, right? Then that's exactly what it becomes. But at some point, they're going to fix it. All right, Billy's coming into the studio. As you heard, at uh, right when we started the 9 o'clock hour, the news came down, and Trev Alberts is going to be the new athletic director at Texas A&M. What does that mean? And again, if the people that were on the committee, RCs of the world, the Schlosses of the world, if the Joni Taylors of the world, if the... If those people co-signed on this hire, then I'm good with it. Um, if the Nebraska fan base is melting down, I'm good with it. Like, think about this. I, I haven't gone into message boards or Reddits to see what they're saying. But do you remember what the Duke fans were doing when Elko was hired and their reaction to it? We're having a similar reaction, apparently, if you believe social media, to the Trevor mm -hmm. Alberts hiring. And with that, we are brought, uh, we're brought, we brought to, we brought to Billy Lucci to the Bad English show here on Tex Ags Radio. Hey, yeah, buddy. We're calling it now. Yeah. There was a good 80s band. I don't know if they were good, but they had a couple of hits called Bad English. I remember Bad English, yeah. I'm trying to think of their song. We'll hear it in the their next lead, segment. Their, their lead singer, I think, for a while anyway, or maybe the whole time, and then he went solo was... John Waite. Are you familiar with John Waite's work? No, I'm not familiar with him at all. Really, you wouldn't be. I, I know bad English. Ailey, you do? Yeah. You I mean, know I, bad I, English. I but speak you don't it all know the, the time, band, yeah. Bad Especially your buddy on Twitter. <laughs> I heard that this morning. John Waite is, uh, I ain't missing you at all. Great song. Yeah, missing you. you. Mm -hmm. No matter what. <laughs> um, I always get that one and then the. Uh, True, Conf oh, those are two classic. To me, anyway, what's true is I think A and M. Did they get a good athletic director? I think so. I mean, look, we've learned that uh, we've learned that the proof is in the pudding, and this is a thanks. this is a unique place. It's not an easy job. Um, good ads have come and and had their hands full with it. Uh, guys that have been successful at other places have come and failed here, uh, whether it be on-field results, whether it be, you know, like, I mean, to me right now, a and in a massive, you know, athletics is operating in a massive deficit, and that's something that, you know, Trev Alberts have to come in and address mm -hmm. from day one and, and work against, and that's not only because of, of Jimbo. That's due to rampant spending prior to Jimbo and prior to Ross it's Ross it's Scott like spend 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 and and uh I think we're entering into a new kind of era I was really impressed with how Mark Welsh and 
the search committee handled this thing. Mm -hmm. um, you had candidates that would talk to the entire, that you know, the entire search committee was involved. You had candidates probably like a Trev Alberts that you had to really narrow down that list because he had a great job for him at a great place for him where he played. Uh, his coach is there, and Tom Osborne. That had to be an, that's got to be an incredibly difficult thing to walk in and say. And that's kind of what we were waiting for today is for him to go actually sign the MOU um, and then go in there and, and say, hey, I'm leaving because that's got to get across a, f a finish line before yeah. it's um, – but since about Friday, I've been calling people, asking. That's about when I knew he was going to be the guy. I think they probably offered it to him. It's today's Wednesday, maybe Monday, Monday night, mm -hmm. Monday afternoon sometime. Friday was actually the first time I heard his name. Um, there were some bad names out there. UCF guy was never considered. Somebody kept talking to me about Air Force, not considered. The confusion there was probably uh, one of the three finalists is a guy at Army who really impressed, but that jump might have been a big jump, pretty significant. But he's kind of like the guy at Troy, the football coach I told you about, that blew them away, and you're like, he's going to be a rising star, right? And I forget where he's at now. He he took another job. He left Troy, and I forget where he went. But Tulane, Tulane. okay, yeah, he's replacing Fritz at Tulane. So keep an eye on him. And I would say keep an eye on the Army AD. I think he's going to be a, a rock star somewhere soon. But I, I really like, and I'd mentioned a long time ago, got Florida State was a candidate. I really like, here, there's a lot of things to like about Albert. And that, Alberts, and that's all you can ask right now, right? Um, I think for the first time in a while, we're going to align like a strong, uh, convicted figure at president, AD, and head football coach. And since President Welsh took over and since Mike Elko took over, I've followed both of those very closely. And I've, I have knew Mike Elko, obviously, from before and, and even while he was at Duke, but getting to know him, the head coach, that much more, I've really dove into trying to learn about his processes, how he plans to run his program, what his vision is, uh, just kind of his philosophies and spent a lot of time listening and learning that. And I've followed uh, the president from afar, but also kind of talking to people that were part of this search committee, people that were candidates for the job. And without, you know, trying to overly dig and never compromise anything, I was, there's not a person at A&M that would not tell you that dude's really impressive on every level, and they all like him. For those that go, well, what are they supposed to say? You guys don't understand, like sometimes. They tell me that off the record. If you think in 25 years here that every leader, every coach, every administrator, every ha hasn't had people come to me and say, I don't like that guy. I don't like that woman. I don't, you know, they're terrible. They're awful. If you don't think those things are said to all me, right. they're going to fail or that. Yes, and these same people that would have no problem telling that to me because I'm not going to come on radio and say, hey, a lot of people freaking hate this person. I'm just going to, I'm not going to say what I'm saying, which is the consensus from everyone I talk to is that is a strong leader that is going to not be scared to make decisions, but he, he trusts the input of the other people that are hired to be in position to give input. It doesn't surprise you with his resume. He's a leader. And I've heard some of the same things about Trev Albert since Friday. I really like, here's one thing that jumps out to me about Trev. Forget the fact that he was a badass as a football player, but that kind of ties in. He's a high NFL draft pick. He's All-American at Nebraska. Stud football player. All world. High level. Then he's, he's in media. He's good. Does a great job in media. He's very visible, very, and he wanted to be an athletic director, and he left all of that and all that visibility and all that money and all that profile, and he left to take a job at Nebraska Omaha. Not Nebraska, where they just hired him from. Not Nebraska, where he played in front of you know, 90,000 people in the black shirts. Nebraska Omaha. He started from the bottom, <clears throat> and what I also don't like about 
or do like about him is he is not he didn't come up through the AD ranks in the cookie cutter fashion that so many do today. Mm-hmm. And look, and that's before people think I'm sitting here taking shots at Ross. I'm not. I'm taking shots at the industry. I like I like Ross personally. I do, but there's a kind of a, a prototype AD now. They're they're spread throughout college sports there's way more of them than there are not where they just they're they're in it from the get-go from a lot of them from the time there's some people probably that we deal with all the time from uh, the sports management program that are gonna as soon as they leave here they're gonna go on that path to be an ad and there's nothing wrong with that that's great i like a change up for a place like this i like someone that that hasn't gone the traditional path he didn't leave college thinking he was going to be an AD, I don't presume. He thought he was going to make a bunch of money in the NFL and then figured it out. And then he, you know, he went, did media, did very well at it. And then he went and said, okay, I'm going to start from as, you know, as bottom as it gets. They were transitioning to Division One, I, I believe, when he was there. And, and here's the other thing I like. He had to cut sports, David. And I know that's taboo. And we don't like to, you guys were talking about that this morning. We don't like hearing that. There's a reality coming in college athletics that might have to happen, not just here, but everywhere. You can fact check me because someone told me this and it's someone I trust, but I haven't gone and looked, but I think he maybe even cut football there, his sport. That's a tough decision to make. Football guy, Nebraska Cornhusker, played under Tom Osborne, went, you know, yeah. covered college football. I think that path and his his kind of track record, I like that Nebraska fans are pissed off and upset. He wasn't on the way out. He didn't see – a lot of people ask me, and I think he was in the mix in some form or fashion, about like Eurocheck at Arkansas. I don't think a lot of people at, in Fayetteville would have cried if he left like they're doing in Lincoln right, right now. Uh, like they were doing in Oxford, you know, like or, or the, I, no one was crying when A and M took Ross. No one was crying. It would have been crying if your check had left Arkansas to come here. That's all I'm saying. They're really bummed out in in Lincoln, Nebraska today in the wake of that news, and that matters. That means something. I call it the John Chavis principle because that's about when I learned that lesson. It's like, dude. You want, when you hire a coach, you want people to be upset when they leave. If you get a football player out of the portal, you don't want that fan base going, you can have him. You know, they did that. A&M fans kind of understood, or people within A&M understood, you know, when Denver Harris left, like, or Chris Marshall, like, okay, that's fine. Great talents. Good luck. When John Chavis came over from LSU, I thought it was a tremendous hire. We all did. And, and then you start to see the LSU reaction. You go, why aren't they crying about it? And I thought they're just like, you know, that's the first time I'd seen it be that kind of nonplus right. over somebody with that type of resume. Well, since then, you pay attention to that kind of stuff more, and it tends to be right more than not. That's why I loved go get Colin Klein. Yeah. I love seeing LSU fans' reaction when Tommy Moffitt signed on, even though he, did, he wasn't actively working there anymore. I love seeing Kansas State fans lament Colin Klein coming here. I love seeing the Kansas reaction to yeah. Jordan, uh, Jordan Peterson. I love, there, there are a lot of those at Florida when Elko went and hired you know, his most recent recruiting assistant. At Duke, when Mike Elko left. You want to see that, and you're certainly seeing that from Nebraska, and by the way, the last time A&M hired an AD from Nebraska, it, it worked out pretty well in, in everything but football. But right. Bill Byrne did a Bill Byrne did a he he did a hell of a job here, and I think I don't know how you equate it, but I don't know if we've had an AD that's done a better job. And I know you know like why would he leave Nebraska is going to be an interesting question because they wanted to keep him. 
And I'd be really fascinated to there, – there's got to be something going on, whether it's the Big Ten. I know another thing about Trev that I researched, he really got NIL going there in Lincoln. That's, that was extremely important with who A&M was going to hire because, again, you don't know where this is going, David. Right. A, are you willing to work well with collectives and things like that? B, is there a plan when this thing shifts – and it shifts to athletics. Are you going to embrace it? And are you going to find ways that you're going to have an advantage over other programs in your league around the country? And he seems to be a guy that is not only willing, but ha has already kind of figured out, you know, how to attack the NIL. And, and these are all boxes to me that he checked. I, out of curiosity, I would love to know why – he would leave Nebraska. I mean, yeah. obviously he thinks this is a great job, but he probably, if I had to guess, it's, there's probably, he sees a tremendous, you know, a, a much greater opportunity here for yeah. long-term success in the AD space. I, I would be willing to bet it's as simple as that. And I think it's pretty telling because again, he was beloved there. He obviously loves the place. I'm sure we'll hear him talk about that a lot. Obviously Tom Osborne, there that presence was very hard to leave so for him to come here he had to see a tremendous <coughs> amount of opportunity for growth and for long-term success and if he can with this president that football coach this amount of money even even though like i said they're gonna have to fix the the budget yep um that's the great myth i think outside about a and m it's like no there's there's a deficit here and it's pretty su substantial and no, they're not doing concerts and soccer games to pay off Jimbo. They're doing that because they've been thinking of ways long ago. Like, they tried to get George Strait here like a year or two years ago, and it, it kind of fell through the timing of the rodeo. I think right. it was two years ago, the timing of the rodeo, and he played that. And They've been working to get events at Kyle Field uh, for that very reason, to kind of like – more ink and I don't think they'll make a ton these artists make the most but soccer these are like high visibility events that are tremendous but they've been doing this for way longer than when they were firing yeah. Jimbo Fisher kind of like right around the time he was if anything they might have done it to pay for the raise he was about to get because it was back about the time when things seemed to be turning up right but uh no I and look I'm gonna say this I don't know when it'll all come out if it has already but Trev Alberts ain't coming cheap. Like, yeah. There's a pretty sub. I don't. Has it? Have they said what is buyout? I haven't seen it, it. No. It's a pretty substantial buyout, more so than I would have thought. A and M would pay for an AD coming into this thing, and uh, Nick believes he read Ross Dellinger four million. Four million. Yeah. yeah, Ross put that. Yeah. So that's again like these are things that we hear about and we wait until they're. But yeah, four million dollar buyout is. That's that's the exact number I was told last, yep. on Friday, and that is very substantial. That's a lot more money than I would have ever thought A and M would pay to buy out. So that tells that you, tells you something right that there. That tells you how badly they wanted him, and it, it's not. I think he. The other thing I don't know if Ross put Nick. I'm. I think he's coming for. He might be making less here than he was making there. That I don't know for sure, but I, when it plays out, don't be surprised to see that. Or maybe it was he had eight-year guarantee. I think he had an eight-year guarantee in Lincoln. I think he's going to have five here. I think Trev Alberts has the potential to be here for a long time yeah. and have a really good career here. And I think, again, like I said, I like his football background. I think he and Mike Elko will work well together. Um, he – certainly doesn't present as any sort of uh, pushover in terms of I think the key will be how do you work with people that probably should take a step back from college football and, and, and Texas A&M football and, and be Just take a step away and realize that's not what you're doing is, is getting involved in the day-to-day -day operations of, of A&M football. And yeah. let the football coach be that and let the athletic director be that and let the university president and then go from there. And I think this place 
is slowly but surely getting a lot better in that regard. I think that was a reputation that they, a hurdle they had to clear during this hiring process. And I think it kind of was an eye opener for a lot of people within that were involved in it, but also people on the outside. So hopefully this will be a start of, of a good change. I love the fact that Mike Elko wants to work alongside his AD yeah. and march together in this thing. I love the fact that Trev Albert's background tells me that will probably be the case. Um, I think Elko is embracing the idea of a strong, get it done type of AD. Yeah. And uh, there's no resistance on his side. That's always a problem when there's resistance on the head football coach's side. And Elko doesn't think he's bigger than the whole thing. And I think these are all these are all positives, and these are all ways that it can work. Let's hit a break. We'll come back with more with Lucci here on Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
Go ahead. You were saying, Billy? Sorry. No, that's not bad English. That's John. John Wait. Yeah. Bad English. I think if I'm if my eighties is going, it's uh, when I see you smile. Mm. When I see you smile. You know that one. I don't know if I know it. your version of uh, it. I, I would wail it if I sang it loud. You would you would know it. Hey. Um. um anyway, can, go ahead. I was going to say something that caught my attention a moment ago. I don't know how much Trev Alberts had to do with this, but I assume he has something to do with it. Uh, the volleyball team playing on uh, on the football I'm stadium, sure ninety two thousand. They had, to, they had to run that through him somehow. That that is a. What am I getting here? By the way, yes, sir. Um, John Waite used to be with the babies. That's what JT Higgins said. JT, what up? John Waite. Wait, then who was with Bad English? I'm going to Google. Anyway, yeah, look up Bad English, who the lead singer was. Anyway, JT knows. JT somebody It says else. Bad English lead singer, John Waite. Okay, so he's with the babies in yeah, he's, Bad English. He's like this the transfer around. He's just babies, going everywhere. I think the babies were before my time. Oh, I, just, um, I can just look at John Waite and say, yeah, I didn't listen to him. Okay, he he he'd probably have kicked your ass. There's no chance of that at all. Trev Alberts would. Oh yeah, Trev 100%. Alberts might want to kick kick my ass based on comments 20 years ago that some guy dug up. By the way, why do we do that? Good work, Aggie. Like it's so like I was on him about comments back 20, and then people on the same thread are like, Nuno grill him about his comments about A and M. Why? It's when they hired Dennis Franchoni. That's what, 20, 20, 20, 22 years ago? I'm not worried about what Trev Alberts as a media entity's opinion was on AM 20 years ago. What he said about AM 20 years ago clearly pissed me off. He just said, if he just said it 20 weeks ago, it would have pissed me off. Um, same thing with Kirk Herbstreet. Same thing with Joel Clatt. Paul Feinbaum, who I like. Same thing with Clatt. You know. Any and all of the above. Along the way you the went way. at SEC Mike. I'm not changing how I am. Right. The way you went at SEC Mike. <laughs> Jeez. Hey, we're I'm, buddies now. I'm not changing who I am. So if that would happen 20 days ago, I would have had a similar reaction. So, but I think with this, with this deal, and by the way, let me tell you something else. As of what time are we at? We're at 1030. Yeah. Um, we, 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 can, uh, we can push back how we got time. Okay, yeah. We're going to push. What, what about Kendall? Kendall's been removed. He's coming on He's later. He's been eliminated. Week. Okay, Kendall. We're going to have him on to talk about Florida. And we hired an AD today. Well, yeah. hold on, hold on. We didn't hire an AD today because as of like 10.05. He hadn't been hired yet. The deal wasn't done yet. Right. And that was kind of kind of like, to me, it's not done until you get the signed MOU and you start, you know, planning, you know, not planning, but lock down the presser and, they locked down their travel to come from Lincoln to College Station. I'm here to tell you that hadn't, that's not the case yet. Right. First of all, same thing happened when we, we talked about, uh, I think it happened after we were doing the Sunday show on Elko. You know, Elko hadn't, no, it was, yeah, it was a Sunday show. Elko didn't get on that plane until late Sunday night. You know, these are, these are hard, hard jobs to leave particularly when you're tied in like that. His alma mater, um, where he played. Like, yeah. And, and that's what makes me think he And must... leaks, leaks don't help at all. Right. And, it, and by the way, this is not for those that want to go after, like when I say this, go, oh, damn, Brent. It's not Brent. Brent's job is not to worry about what a and His job is the Houston Chronicle. And they go out and get stories. They have since you and I were little kids, yeah. since everybody listening were little kids. That's, their, that's that job. I don't do that job. He does that job as well as anybody. I don't do that job. My job is, in my opinion, is like I sit here and go, I want it across the finish line. I like to get the green light. Because for me long term and, and our relationships and my relationships, I like to never – kind of float in there and, and jack up the process, whether it's scheduling a game, whether it's hiring a coach, whether it's a right. coach hiring a coach, whether it's an AD. The newspaper's job is when you hear it and can confirm it, you, you go with it. And that is, that is the job. And like I said, nobody does it better than Brent. So I don't like when I'm saying that, I don't want people to go, oh, man, 
because this thing's going to get across the finish line. This is different roles. Yeah, this thing's going to get across the finish line. But I'm just saying, normally we don't like to go with it until it's across. Um, and you know me, and everybody in here knows how many times I've been sitting there, refresh, refresh, going, if I lose this, I'm going to be really pissed. I'm going to be really pissed. And uh, But as I sit here right now, as we sit here at 10, you know, unless something's happened in the last 30 minutes, and I just ran a check, that's not across the finish line. If it comes out in the newspapers or nationally, it's not so big a deal where the, the candidate, you know, kind of goes, what the hell are you guys doing? Mm -hmm. If it comes from Tex Ags and they know the kind of acts, then it looks real obvious. Like, hey, so that's why I like to see it go across the finish line because you don't want to piss off or break a degree of trust between two sides here. If Bruce Feldman put it out or Staples or whoever, that could come from the agent side. That could right. come, you know, there's all over. There's a million different places. Hence the Mark Stoops thing. You know, the Mark Stoops thing, I got that from nowhere to do with A&M. But I knew it was true. And I posted that on Friday, put his name out there along some other names. By the way, Kyle Whittingham was very much in play at that time, too. Nobody saw Whittingham, they saw me say Stoops is gaining momentum and they were like bells and whistles with that mm -hmm. with that phrase. And I remember telling Ross on Saturday, like, hey, if you want to know what the <coughs> board and everybody that you talk to tonight are thinking right now, they all went to not all but pretty much all of them went to AM. They're all fans. They all are gonna react probably very similarly to what the fan base is reacting so there's your hint and it and just and they're just going to plow ahead to the finish line on that one yeah but point being of all that said it's not done yet um and i guess we'll follow up later today hopefully in the short term future and let, let everyone know when it's done you know quote completely unquote, done 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 yeah are you sticking around or are we done? Yeah, I don't think we're done done. We may as well stick around. All right. So uh, you can do, do your recruiting country read. Bronny has two days to host. I'm sure he can fit Howell into the show yep. Thursday or Friday. Hal, we'll talk to you soon. Uh, right now, though, we're talking about 1,212. Thanks, Jace. I'll talk to you today. Uh, did you or someone you know graduate from A&M in the last 12 years, uh, and are you leading by example in business or in service? If that's the case, the Association of Former Students would like to invite you to nominate yourself or someone that you know for the 12 under 12 Young Alumni Spotlight. So each year, the association recognizes a dozen Aggies who have graduated within the last 12 years for their business accomplishments, civic or military service, philanthropic efforts, and outstanding representation of A&M's core values of excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, and selfless service. Previous year honorees have included uh, leaders in business and higher education, architects, petroleum engineers, nonprofit executives, physicians, veterans, and members of the U.S. Armed Forces. 2024 nominations close Sunday, March 31st, so be sure to submit a nomination soon. To learn more about the recognition, submit a nomination. Visit tx.ag slash 12 under 12 nominations.
Text Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Yesterday I got a text message at a, I don't remember what time it was, but somebody that I know that was bragging about getting to um, the gymnasium, if you will, or the gym before I got there. I wonder who that was. That was me. First time in our relationship? Beat you to it. You did. You did. Pretty awesome. Did you stay longer? Um, we also did something very embarrassing there. We went through yeah, fight moves at the gym. I was like, dude, this is what we make fun of. This is what I make fun of. But you were interested in the, in the information I was, I was providing. Nuyo was showing me some of the stuff he'd learned, and we're sitting there like, and I finally it. realized what was happening. And I was like, hey, thank God the, uh, you know, the Brawny Chronicles they weren't there yeah, to record it. But uh, look, in fairness, if I saw you and him doing that, <laughs> I'd have been all 100%. over it. 100%. I would have been sitting there zooming in. People would be like, what's this guy filming at the gym? And I'd be like, well, look at these two bozos. We were those bozos. Yeah, but they were never again. Yeah, you're right. I, I not was here, not there. Not everywhere. Not everywhere. Maybe here, off camera. Okay. But Nuno was showing me some of the you know the moves he'd learn when he's I I can't go into it because I'm too funny. <laughs> I'm not Theo Vaughn, although Leone will tell you I had a, a Theo Vaughn moment yesterday with something I made a comment about his haircut. Yeah. And he'll never forget it. He thinks it was one of my better ones. But I uh, I could be really funny right now about your pastime and you and, you know, locking people in leg locks and whatever it is you're doing over there. But I'm not. You're not going to make fun of me. I'm not going to comment on it. But, but it was the first but time. But the move you showed in the gym, like – who knows? Maybe I'll have to use it one day. Maybe I'll have to, you know, burrow my head into somebody's chest. Yes, turn to the side. Turn my shoulder into their into their abdomen. Right here to the shoulder. Pick them right. up, look over my shoulder, and dump them. That was the because move that I happened learned. so often. Hey, so many times I run into that problem. You did look at me when I was telling you. I was like, I, I might use this someday. Like, yeah, there like, was you could you could see where it would work. <laughs> you could see where it would work. What do you want from an AD? Right, like you, you've followed this program for a long time. Mm -hmm. What are some of the attributes that you've seen from other ads? Obviously, with the football changing or college okay. sports in general changing, what do you want? I was really encouraged by this search because what I was look, I knew when the time is right, I'll start getting some names, and and what I would do is anytime other names are like, I'd go and say, no, he's not one. No, you know, people were asking about you know, certain names that were interviewed preliminarily and cut loose. A couple of them, people would go, oh, yeah, he seems really, you know, that would have been a good one. Well, not per what, what they found out on some of these. Not nothing bad, but just like, no, that's not a fit. No, we can't find people saying good things about their pretty bad reputation. Or this guy probably is looking for his next job, you know, before the cavalry gets to him. Those are guys you don't want to hire. So that's number one. Trev Alberts checks that box in that Nebraska's clinging to him. Health, they might be fighting. Not, they are going to fight for him until he signs and is out the door. It's happening right now. Um, I think from talking to those involved, you know, uh, to varying levels over the last few weeks, and I wasn't – You have. I was really trying to – and always do try to respect the the process, um, but also find out. I want to know what they're looking for, and and I was pleasant, not pleasantly surprised, but I was happy. The more I talked to people in the know, of like what they were looking for, because it's what I think this place. Needs. It, you need. I want an AD a that will embrace and understand the magnitude and scope of NIL, yep. and the potential that hey, you might have to be as an athletic director in charge of your department paying players almost salaried employees for lack of a better term and maybe who knows one day that might be the term in the short term future so you've got to embrace and more importantly like understand like, like i said the magnitude and scope of nil i want that i want someone like i said that's going to be have their own opinion on things have their own experience to draw on you know and not kind of how the AD thing is supposed to go. Here's what you're likely to run into. Because you can take all that crap and you can do this with it. What you were trained and what, what you think's coming as an AD, it's gone. Good Times shot. are changing. 
So I want someone that I feel like understands that and can ad can adapt when they're going to have to adapt. And I mentioned the, hey, if, if worst case scenario and you have to cut sports down the road, it, that's a tough, tough one. And I hope it never comes to that. But everyone that you talk to in college football or college sports will tell you it's probably coming to that to some degree. So that's part of it. Can they un do they understand and they can they see what's coming in college athletics? And will they be able to adapt? So I think the less formal, hey, you've been come up through the system and you've been classically trained and all that, I think the less of that, the better. For this place at this time, anywhere at this time, but especially at this place, I want a strong personality. Uh, I want someone that's going to stand in front of the microphone and say things of substance. And I think his background tells you that. Even – even talking about A and M, yeah, that rubbed me wrong. It rubbed every you know Aggies wrong. They want hey, ask him about what he said twenty something. You know, to ask him about what he said something twenty years ago, but he sat in front of a mic every week and said opinions that were not going to be popular, whether he's right or wrong. Saying opinions, which is what they asked him to do, that weren't popular with a different fan base every every time well, he took a mic. And opinions I, change, I, but I, I'm fine with that. But I want that. Uh -huh. I want an AD that's going to sit up there and say something that might not be popular. I want them to get up there, and, and when the microphone goes in front of their face, they're going to say what they think, and, and not a bunch of package stuff and buzzwords and catchphrases. So get up there and say what you think, and, and be real with us as, as donors, as fans, as regents, as coaches, as athletes. Get up there and be real. And I think, th he, I think he checks from, you know, Everything I've asked and found out, he checks those boxes. And I wanted, I'll be honest with you, you know, like I wanted a, a guy that really knew and understood football and big time college football. And I know that times have changed in the last mm -hmm. 25 years, but that guy's been, he played at Nebraska when they were as big time as it got. Yep. As big time as big time will ever be. And he played at Nebraska during that time. He started at Nebraska during that time. He played for one of the all-time legends of this game. And he played at a place that has not been good for a while now because the landscape of college football has changed so much. Nebraska was certainly a, a casualty of that. But he, he's been there where they're still, by the way, selling out every single game. So to break, we'll come back with a short segment to close out the show. It's Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
By the way, we didn't get to Recruiting Country presented by Caprock Health System, a faster patient-centered revolution in care with two ERs in the BCS, the original 24-hour ER in South College Station on William D. Fitch, and the full-service hospital with ER in, in Bryan on Briarcrest, online at caprockhealthsystem.com. We'll see if Bronnie can get that these next two days because I'll be off. Also, it's time to end the day with Double Dave's caller number 12, 979 <laughs> We're going to hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls and a large one-topping pizza from Double Days, who have been serving Aggieland since 1984 with your favorite pizza and world-famous pepperoni rolls. Reliable in-house delivery, bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click on DoubleDays.com, and your favorites are on their way. Billy, scary game last night, but yep. they hey, they found a way, and that's what I care about. I'm more like right now, yeah, first of all, here's a post that made message board geniuses. Real. How are anything from Nebraska other than a volleyball coach team suspect? The positive... I, why do we do this? Like, what I happened? understand, like, if you're not jumping over the moon over any hire ever, uh, or every hire ever gets you to jump over the moon, but have a little more insight before you go and, and melt. And somebody said, should we mark Stoops this hire? Like, come on, guys. Like, if you think you'd look at Nebraska athletics and go, oh, they're not. Like, you'd go crazy over, over – uh, Ole Miss because they hired Lane Kiffin and, and uh, Chris Beard. I'd love to have that discussion with you. Um, you'd love to have, like, I, I think Chris Del Conte is a really good AD. I think if you flip Chris Del Conte and Trev Alberts, and, and Trev Alberts got to Texas at the time CDC did, which, by the way, he wasn't the one pushing for Steve Sarkeesian to be hired. Those were the people. Mm -hmm. Other people involved in such decisions. I think it's been well documented that the choice there was Sonny Dykes, which had a hell of a year last year. But, and you put CDC at Nebraska. I think that's a whole, <laughs> those are two completely different jobs. Yeah. And I think you have to look so much further than what is Nebraska good at and why. And you do the same thing with Texas, with the resources they have. You go to Alabama and Greg Byrne, who I really like personally. I like I liked his dad. I like Greg. You go to Alabama and you take over when Nick Saban's already the football coach there. And look, Nate Oates was a tremendous hire. But you go, I think he's a good AD. But again, you go throw a, a Trev Alberts down there in Tuscaloosa in the peak of Nick Saban and what he was doing, that is a uh, completely different deal. I think you look at the hire right now, and I'm, I'm fired up about it. They need to get it across the finish line, I'm telling you. Thank you, Billy. All Appreciate right. you. Bronny, and tomorrow and Friday, that's going to do it for Tech Sex. We'll see you mañana.